Nothing there. Darren, you get a personalized one? All right. Uh, good morning to one and all. I'd like to call the February 14th, 2020 meeting of the Board of Regents to order. The first item on the agenda is approval of the December minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve those minutes. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the December minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The minutes are approved. Uh, next, we will turn to the report of the President. President Gable, over to you. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Swiggum, members of the board. I'm very pleased with. Uh, to be with you this morning. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Uh, I, I think there's much news to report on since our last time together in December. First, uh, shortly after our December board meeting, I traveled to Washington, D.C., uh, December 17th and 18th, to participate in the U.S. Council on Competitiveness's 2019 National Competitiveness Forum. I'm a commissioner in this forum, uh, and it brings together over 200 C-suite leaders from every major sector of the economy and the military to share their perspectives on how to confront and overcome critical competitiveness challenges facing the United States. The commission itself is on innovation and competitiveness frontiers, which is a multi-year national movement to transform the way we innovate across the United States. And work is underway to draft a new national innovation agenda. And I look forward to continuing to engage in that process and we'll keep you posted on next steps. Shortly thereafter, I traveled to support Gopher Athletics twice, the first to Pittsburgh to support our women's volleyball team in the final four, and then to Tampa from December 26th to January 1st to engage with our community and celebrate Gopher football team's victory over Auburn in the Outback Bowl on New Year's Day. I also participated at the NCAA convention in San Diego late last month, which was followed by travel to Naples, Florida to meet with donors and alums. And last week I was in New York for media interviews with Bloomberg News and the New York Times. In between, I was able to participate in some particularly meaningful events on the Twin Cities campus, from our ROTC Veteran Services lunch to the Martin Luther King Day concert and as a Carlson School's first Tuesday lunch and speaker. And I was very happy to join Minnesota CEOs last month in Minneapolis to discuss strategies to address the state's educational achievement gaps, which are some of the worst in the nation, and to participate in MBOLD's first quarter meeting to engage with Minnesota's globally leading and growing base of agriculture and food companies and organizations. In addition, at a press conference at the Anoka Ramsey Community College campus on January 13th, I joined Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and other senior administration leaders as they announced their support for our capital needs, which are uh, part of the governor's local jobs and projects plan. 
Members of the board, the legislature has the opportunity to expand higher education's impact on the state through some important strategic investments this session. As you know, our top priority in St. Paul is to restore existing facilities by undertaking renovation and improvement projects across our campuses. And earlier this week, I greeted legislators and engaged on our capital request at the State House to kick off the 2020 legislative session. This follows important engagement with legislators over several of the past recent weeks, from Senators Anderson, Claussen, and Hayden to Speaker Hortman and Representative Dowd, as well as through our 2020 legislative kickoff breakfast on January 28th, which was well attended with thanks to board leadership and fellow regents for coming. And I look forward to engaging with our partners in St. Paul during the legislative session. With the board's much appreciated approval in December, Dr. Rachel Croson will be joining us as the university's next executive vice president and provost. Her first day is on March 30th, 2020, and I update you that her onboarding is going very well with great appreciation to Karen Hansen. I'm very excited about Rachel joining our senior leadership team, and we will be honoring Provost Hansen at a future meeting. <laughs> Also, in regard to searches, as shared across our system last month, we're launching a national search for a new Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students. This person will have primary responsibility for the student affairs portfolio on the Twin Cities campus, and at the system level, a collaborative role with the Vice Chancellors for Student Affairs or Student Life on the Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester campuses in broad consultation with senior leaders, deans, faculty, staff, and students, and in alignment with the best practices of our peer institutions, I've decided to elevate this position to move its reporting line directly to me. Vice President for Equity and Diversity Michael Goh and College of Education and Human Development Dean Jean Kwam have graciously and with my appreciation agreed to co-chair the search committee and listening sessions are in progress. The hope is that we would bring finalists to campus for public interviews before the end of the semester. Interim Vice Provost for Student Affairs and Dean of Students Maggie Towell has informed me that she does not intend to be a candidate, but is committed to serving in the role until a new leader is in place. I cannot thank Maggie enough for her ongoing leadership and dedication to student affairs and to the university, for her support for me personally and professionally as we've gone through the transition, and for the work we know she will continue to do in support of the new Vice President. With regard to student mental health, yesterday, the board's Mission Fulfillment Committee heard a presentation on student mental health and next steps towards a mental health initiative. As part of that work, we are engaging with Minnesota State and Chancellor Devinder Maholtra, as well as our private Minnesota partners and college counterparts to convene a mental health summit on May 14th in St. Paul. And I'll share more details on that as the date and planning draws nearer. With regard to coronavirus, we continue to closely monitor global public health concerns, and of course lately, that has focused our attention very strongly on the novel coronavirus. Dr. Jacob Tolar, our campus public health officer and staff in the health emergency response team, Boynton Health, the Office of Human Resources, the GPS Alliance, and University Relations are working closely with the Minnesota Department of Health and CDC and State Department guidelines. We've been keeping the campus informed through a safe campus website and other communi communication channels, which we've been updating as new information becomes available. Members of the university community, students, faculty, or staff who are concerned about the spread of illness or their safety can find good resources and information there, which should be able to help answer their questions and alleviate concerns. With regard to campus dining, in October, the board approved a two-year campus dining contract extension for Aramark. Campus dining is an extremely important topic across our university community, in particular for our students, and so we've taken steps to advance greater inclusion for them in the decision-making process. Our student advisory committee has elected one student, Isaiah Agrin, to serve on the management committee, which is the group that will review and make recommendations to the executive committee that guides the RFP process. And the RFP is expected to be issued in the late spring. I'd like to provide an update on system enrollment and progress on the system-wide strategic enrollment management council, and in particular, uh, some steps we've taken to improve and advance system-wide strategic enrollment strategy. First, we've moved the use of Share My App, which is an app program that provides students who apply to the Twin Cities campus the opportunity to have their application shared with one of the greater Minnesota campuses. 
Based on advancements in communication and the ease in sharing the application, Share My App rates are up significantly for the fall 2020 admission cycle. For example, UMD's Share My App numbers grew over 300% since last year, from 610 to 1,861 shared applications. At the same time, in early February, the Twin Cities campus provided the Greater Minnesota campuses with part of their Fall 2020 defer list, which should allow all of the campuses to have the opportunity to reach out to students for possible admission. We'll have much more information about how this is all playing out at the March meeting, and I'll provide you with a progress report at that time. I'd like to update you on the board charge on institutional history. As part of the administrative's work, the administration's work to fulfill the board's charge from April 2019 to develop ongoing commemoration and educational activities that reflect our complex institutional history. The Office of the President is co-sponsoring a Twin Cities screening of a TPT documentary premiere on February 18th at Northrop Auditorium entitled The Free North, which highlights African American history and the University of Minnesota. Earlier today, the Board's Governance and Policy Committee participated in the second of a three-part series of presentations related to the development of a renamings policy framework, and the committee provided feedback regarding a draft policy proposal. In June, at the earliest, an updated draft policy will be considered by the committee, and in the interim, I'm committed to ensuring this work continues to be done in a collaborative and consultative manner, and I look forward to consultating with the university community as a whole about the policy over the course of the spring. I'd like to update you on outreach. At the December meeting, you may recall that we highlighted our interactive impact web application, which coalesces and quantifies the university's outreach and engagement efforts, which was an important charge of the board coming out of the retreat in July and one of the board's goals for this year. Work continues to populate the map with more data, and later in this meeting, you'll hear an update about this work and our system-wide efforts around outreach and engagement. And I know at earlier phases of this meeting, you've had a chance to meet with some of our faculty and research and outreach center directors, and we're very grateful to them for sharing their insights about the work they do to fulfill the university's systems outreach and engagement mission. Also later in this meeting, you'll be hearing an update from me about our system-wide strategic planning efforts, in particular, what we're doing in support of student success. And in that regard, lastly, I'm absolutely thrilled to announce a $15 million gift from the Benson Foundation to support undergraduate admission, retention, and graduation among students with the greatest financial need across our system. This support provides life-changing benefits for our students and our state, keeping the university affordable and accessible for all Minnesotans. The board will consider this gift through the consent agenda in just a few minutes, but first I'd like to offer a very special and personal thank you to CEO Judy Dutcher, who's here today, and members of the Benson Foundation Board for this transformational gift. Members of the board, it's been an exciting start to the spring semester, and I look forward to briefing you later in this meeting about progress towards our system-wide strategic plan. Thank you for all you do for the University of Minnesota. Thank you, all right. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, um, um, President uh, Gable. So I'll keep my report uh, very brief today. We have a very full agenda. I'd like to start by adding uh, my thanks uh, to the Benson Foundation for, the, for their gift, which I, I would add is a matching gift, and so it's the $15 million, but it, it will be a magnet for uh, substantially more uh, money uh, dedicated to this purpose, so it's really, uh, it's really a terrific gift. So um, I just want to make a few comments on um, outreach, uh, which has been a focus uh, of the board over, the, over uh, uh, yesterday and will continue uh, today, uh, reminding everybody that last summer, uh, when we met to outline our priorities uh, as one of those five core priorities, we said we will clearly define, articulate, and promote the university's outreach mission and develop a system plan to guide and measure uh, its, uh, its impact. It's really a very, very important uh, part of the work that we do. Yesterday, we had an opportunity to discuss with a few individuals how the university connects with Minnesota's communities through outreach and public engagement. We heard from faculty and leadership from the College of Design, School of Public Health, 
and the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and we were once again reminded of the breadth and the depth of the university's outreach across our state. And then last night, we hosted directors from many of the university's research and outreach centers across the state. And I want to thank all of the uh, people who, who visited with us uh, at East Cliff uh, last night. It was a terrific conversation. Very exciting to hear about the work that the university is doing in all corners uh, of the state. So we'll have a third element of this conversation uh, during the meeting today as we have a discussion with Provost Hansen, Vice President Matt Kramer, and Associate Vice President Andy Furco about how the university communicates the impact of research. So we look forward to that item uh, later uh, in the agenda. With that, I you know, <coughs> conclude my chair's report. Moving on to the next item, please note the receive and file items uh, in the docket this month. Next, we'll consider the consent report. Is there a motion to approve the consent report? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Any discussion or comments on the consent report? Hearing none, uh, all in favor of approving the consent report? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion is approved. Our next agenda item requires board action for the approval of the 2019 University Performance and Accountability Report. We had the opportunity to review and discuss this draft at our December meeting. I will not have any additional presentation today. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the report uh, before turning to uh, any questions that you may have. Is there a motion to approve the report? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded to approve the 2019 University Performance and Accountability Report. Any discussion or comments from any regions? Okay, there being no further discussion, all those in favor of approving the Performance and Accountability Report, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. All right, that motion is approved. All right. <clears throat> Now we'll, we will uh, move to the next item on the agenda, which is an update on the system-wide strategic plan uh, and its goals. Uh, President Gable will update us now on uh, her progress on this uh, very, very important project. And uh, so I'll just turn it over to uh, President Gable for her update. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Sviggum, members of the board. At our last meeting in December, I formally presented the university system commitments which are where we found the intersection between the values and the action that the university system is calling for, and then they guide our strategic planning efforts going forward. That presentation followed our meetings in September and October, where I highlighted timeline and consultation plans towards the board's review and discussion of our system-wide strategic plan in May with anticipated action in June and a review or refresh of the maroon and gold measures likely over the summer. In the draft system goals I present to you today, like the commitments, we're looking at the result of broad and ongoing consultation with faculty, staff, students, alumni, supporters, partners around the state, partners in the legislature, and other friends of the university and university community members. These draft system goals represent how we intend to fulfill our system commitments. This phase of the discussion of the strategic planning process can be a little bit frustrating. I've described it to some of our constituency groups as we framed the house, and that was very exciting. And now the wiring and the plumbing is going in, and it's less obvious where the progress lies. This is the bridge between our statement of values in the commitments and what we will come to at retreat, which is actual action items, where we're bridging between broad statements and leaning into what will ultimately be measured. So if we identify our commitments, the goals are how we fulfill those commitments. And then later, when we identify action items, we will be at the step of saying the things, the discrete things we would actually be doing. But I want to take this step by step, even if it feels a little slow in this interim and incremental step, because it's important for us to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we can see the direction in which we're going, rather than having to loop back once we're nearly done and rewrite or refine where we are. So I would like to use this time to talk about the goals that sit in between before 
at our next meeting, we get into the actual details of what we will do. So with that said, within our first commitment of student success, the draft goals include first, to attract, educate, and graduate students who represent the diversity, talent, workforce, and citizenship needs of the future. Just to give you a sense of what a goal like this might mean in the future when we start to articulate action items, action items could include, and likely would, the system-wide enrollment strategy, a plan for expanded retention and transfer student strategies, and others. But just to give you a sense of what a goal like this might mean. The second goal is to enhance the student experience, wellness, and success. Action items could include our developing student mental health initiative, and likely would, or initiatives and support for graduate students, which we know we've been talking about on and off pretty consistently for uh, really for the entirety of the university's life. Goal three, under commitment one, is to increase innovative and high quality educational offerings across modes of delivery to reach students where they are. The intent here is to house the action items around online or distributed learning strategies, for example, and there could be others. Moving to commitment two, the goals first are to increase high impact discovery and scholarship. This entire commitment is around research, innovation, and impact, and so the goals reflect that in how we've broken down across each of those areas. So within the first goal, You've already heard from Vice President Chris Kramer last fall, and we'll hear from him again, on his plans to increase research funding levels and his action items in that regard. With regard to driving creativity, collaboration, and the entrepreneurial spirit, action items could include undergraduate research experiences, opportunities to expand our corporate partnerships more strategically, and of course, tech commercialization and alternative revenue evolving from those efforts. And then the third goal, apropos to the remarks that uh, both I and Chair Powell made earlier and the work of this entire board meeting, is to engage Minnesota. And this goal reflects our work to engage the state and beyond, and action items could and likely would include measuring the breadth and depth of our engagement and expanding our storytelling role. And you'll hear a robust presentation about this in a few minutes. So moving on to commitment three, within our Minter Sections commitment, the draft goals include to drive innovation for next generation health. This could include investments in core areas of strength, like work with the Institute for Child and Adolescent Brain Health, innovative clinical training, med tech, and the unique investment in research that derives from our partnership with Fairview. Under building a sustainable future, the likely action items would be anchored in our campus's efforts to be more sustainable and our efforts to convene in studying the environment and our approach as a university to the emerging climate emergency. Under goal three, advancing natural resources and agri-food systems to elevate human security and potential. Action items here could include ideas such as advancing and deploying new techniques for smart farming. So just to give you a sense of what the goals mean and where the action items could go. I will note before we move on to commitment four that the Minter section's goal is how we derive strategic planning around the unique depth of the questions and opportunities posed by the state of Minnesota and our unique capacity as a university system to answer those questions. Within this particular strategic commitment is where we're likely to see agility and evolution more quickly as different questions emerge. So these three goals would be what we would come through the gate with, so to speak, but they could evolve over time. They could change over time, probably more quickly than in some of the other areas, depending on how things evolve. In commitment four, community and belonging, the first goal would be to recruit and retain diverse talent. This would be around recruiting and retaining talented faculty, staff, and students, and you saw uh, and we'll hear a presentation on this and ongoing conversation on this. Goal two, to have a welcoming and inclusive campus climate. This is around traditional definitions or what are emerging actually, <laughs> if a tradition can emerge, around what it means to measure campus climate. But this would also include things like our engagement survey, the happiness of our faculty, staff, and students working here, being students here, and what that means for our campus community as a whole. And then goal three is advancing understanding and nurturing and to nurture enduring partnerships. So this goal reflects our work around our institutional history, which we discussed earlier today, largely reflected within the board charge from last spring and the action items that are emerging from that. 
as well as our responsibility to strengthen our relationships with our historic partners and our neighbors. So what it means to sit within this community physically and have a sense of place, as well as things like the activities and action items we will likely identify with our tribal community partners. And then under commitment five, fiscal stewardship, the first goal is to reduce financial barriers to student achievement. This one almost writes itself around leading edge pricing models, commitments to reduce undergraduate debt, and how we would look for philanthropic support, like the support we identified earlier with the generosity of the Benson Foundation. Goal two, invigorates revenue allocation to encourage forward thinking mission fulfillment. This goal is likely to result in action items that look at how our costs exist. And you heard the first step in that process yesterday with the administrative cost benchmarking study, where our new revenue opportunities might lie, and how we might align our budget allocation with the incentives that will emerge once action items are articulated. Goal three is to build comprehensive and long-range capital facilities and land holding strategies to drive strategic growth. This is the overt conversation about what it means for us to acquire or sell or build or retain or invest in our infrastructure across the system in order to do what we're charged to do. And then goal four is risk management and safety. This is something that we do already. This is not new, but it is to invigorate what we do here and re-envision it with the context of enterprise risk and safety uh, so that we are um, doing what we are supposed to do in terms of keeping all of our constituents safe. In the interim, uh, we have been consulting widely across our system. The goals that you see here reflect a robust set of conversations, just like the action items that you'll see in the future and that we'll discuss around the, uh, uh, around the retreat table in a, a month or so. We've been up on each campus discussing what you see here. We will be doing a system-wide email, again, one of several, with an online link for our university community to provide input. We will send the same message or, or a related message to our alums, state government, elected officials, the governor, lieutenant governor, county commissioners, mayors, city council members, amongst others, so that we have as robust a feedback loop as possible to reflect that this plan is for the system as a whole. And we'll seek continued input from the business community, including members of the Minnesota Business Partnership. So I would like to thank everyone because obviously this is a tremendous team sport even to get to this point with much work yet to do. But in particular, I want to thank uh, Professor John Bryson, who is a professor in the Humphrey School, who's on leave but stopped what he was doing. He's a nationally recognized expert in strategic planning, and he's been the angel on our shoulder in much of the design of what we're talking about today and, and council, which helps us make sure that we leverage the strength of our subject matter expertise to try and do things right. So with that, I will open the floor to discussion and questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So let me just um, make a brief comment. Um, thank you for a very content-rich um, overview. And just to remind the board, we will be spending uh, uh, quite a bit of time uh, at our retreat reviewing these areas that President Gable has just described in quite a bit more depth and detail at the retreat uh, next month. So with that, um, any uh, comments, reactions, discussions, suggestions, anything from the board? Uh, Thank Science. you, Chair Paul. Thank you, uh, President Gable. I really appreciate this this overview. And you may have mentioned it, and I may have missed it, but looking at the different goals on a, in a broad way, I assume that underneath that we're going to have uh, action items or specifics that we can evaluate over time yes. and, and make changes. So this is just a overview right now, and you're going to have bullet points under it? Yeah, that's correct, Regent Simonson. Okay, thank you. Others? Other comments? All right. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, President Gable, and for the, for the questions. We appreciate the update and very much look forward to uh, our discussion um, next month. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. So next we'll turn to a discussion uh, of strategies for enhancing diversity and inclusion uh, within our faculty. I want to remind everybody that one of the board's priorities this year is to deepen institutional understand understanding of pathways to greater faculty, staff, and student diversity and inclusion, and identify specific strategies across the system. So I'll welcome our presenters, uh, Michael Goh, Vice President for Equity and Diversity, Rebecca Ropers, Vice President for Faculty and Academic Affairs, Keisha Varma, Associate Vice President for Equity and Diversity, and Valerie Forbes, the Dean of the College of Biological Sciences. 
So I want to thank all of you for joining us, and Dr. Go, we'll turn it over to you to kick us off. Thank you, Chair Powell, President Gable, members of the board. I'm pleased to be joined by Vice Provost Rebecca Ropers, Associate Vice Provost Keisha Varma that you met yesterday, and Dean Valerie Forbes from the College of Biological Sciences to discuss this important conversation about faculty diversity at the University of Minnesota. I appreciate Regent McMillan's comment this morning that faculty are the academic heart of this university. And I think in your docket, uh, you've heard many times the uh, scholarship around faculty diversity as enhancing the learning educational experience of all that are involved at this university. I only have some brief comments to make, but just to situate this conversation, this begins a three-part series, so to speak, an ongoing conversation uh, around strategies for enhancing diversity at the University of Minnesota, beginning with faculty today, and then later in the year, um, student diversity, and then staff diversity. I have three brief comments to make to, to frame our conversation before I hand it over to my panelists. Uh, the first involves just how we are represented today. Um, we are here not just to share the time, we are here to share um, not just also an interest in the topic, but we're here to reflect the complexities of who and what and how is involved in faculty diversity hiring. It's complex, it involves multiple stakeholders, it involves multiple strategies, actions, people at multiple points, multiple layers. Um, and while there will be universal strategies that we're sharing today, there are definitely unique disciplinary situations and campus geographical situations that we have to consider. But with that in mind, um, we also want to emphasize that hiring of faculty is, an, is a college level decision, but the Office for Equity and Diversity partnering closely with our colleagues in the provost's office and our academic affairs uh, leadership, chancellors, vice chancellors, um, executive vice chancellors on our system campuses work closely to create programs, initiatives to help enhance this recruitment process. Having said that, we emphasize the important role that college leadership plays. And for that reason, college uh, dean, college of biological sciences dean, Valerie Forbes is here to share some of the strategies that pertain to her college situation. That's first. My second comment is around um, the fact that faculty diversity hiring doesn't occur in a vacuum. Um, our efforts to recruit for faculty diversity is definitely impacted by societal, by national, by international um, contexts around diversity. Um, the diversity that exists within society, within educational systems, and within higher education. For that reason, we are creative in trying to develop ways in which we can enhance diversity in the doctoral educational process in the diversity of graduate education, in the diversity of students who complete high school, and so on and so forth. Hence, you will see the connections, hopefully, that this relates just as much to our conversation yesterday around multicultural student success and access, how it connects also to our ongoing conversations around campus climate because beyond hiring of diverse faculty, we have the awesome task of re retaining, creating a sense of community, and, and, and a sense of respect in how every faculty member, regardless of their views and their worldviews, feel a sense of belonging. And when we talk about that region's figure, you can be sure we hear you loud and clear about who is included in that correct category. You don't have to write any more notes? <laughs> no, I was, I was going to save you the question, so I knew that was coming, okay. so we Thank can you, save Dr. some time Mr. there, Chairman, possibly. I can throw my notes away. <laughs> my third um, and final comment is the fact that many of us sitting at this table um, have to think about these issues system-wide. So definitely, while we think about strategies and programs and initiatives, um, we believe that many of our strategies and ideas and on a high level um, consider, uh, are considered universal, but we also recognize the challenges and the unique geographical contextual situations that each campus will face. So with that, I'm pleased to hand this over to Vice Provost Ropers. Good morning, Chair Powell and, and Regents. Um, 
deciding which mic to use here. <laughs> First of all, what are we talking about when we talk about faculty diversity? So it's clear to academic leaders throughout the U University of Minnesota that faculty diversity is key to our success. We share the board's commitment to faculty, staff, and student diversity. And we believe that diversity of identities, of ideas, of a lived experiences, and then the perspectives that come from those three are all important for the work that we do. Faculty diversity strengthens our community and the work that we do in many ways. First, it allows us to better achieve our mission and enact our values. We are dedicated to the advancement of learning and the search for truth, to the sharing of this knowledge through education for a diverse community, and to the application of this knowledge to benefit the people of the state, the nation, and the world. To enact this mission, the university seeks to provide an atmosphere of mutual respect, free from racism, sexism, and other forms of prejudice and intolerance, assist individuals, institutions, and communities in responding to a continuously changing world, and to be conscious of and responsive to the needs of the many communities that it is committed to serving. These commitments, as I'm sure you recognize, come from our mission statement. They're the mission statement and principles. And diversifying our faculty allows us to better enact that mission and those principles in very clear ways. Faculty diversity allows us to create and support a, diversity, a diverse community in which students, staff, and faculty can thrive. By providing role models and facilitating a sense of belonging, we can better serve the entire community to which we are accountable and from which we draw or should draw, draw our future leaders. As Scott Lanyon, Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School, recently wrote, increasing the diversity of students receiving graduate degrees and scholars receiving postdoctoral training is the graduate school's highest strategic priority. However, our ability to diversify graduate education is constrained by the fact that our faculty are not themselves diverse. Indeed, the single biggest barrier to the recruitment and retention of a diversity of students is the low diversity of faculty. I advocate for making increasing faculty diversity a top priority of the University of Minnesota. And then you have heard from others in the Office of Undergraduate Education and the Office of Equity and Diversity over many months, many years, about how important student or diversity is to student learning, and that diversity is at the student and at the faculty level. We need to create a diverse and inclusive learning environment. Faculty diversity is key to that. So all aspects of our mission are enriched by faculty diversity. Our research is strengthened when those crafting both questions and approaches to knowing bring different experiences and expertise to their work. What happens in our classrooms, laboratories, online, and in many other sites is enriched by people bringing multiple perspectives to the educational interactions in ways that generate the aha moments that I'm sure all of us have had as people become aware of new ways of interacting with the world and new ways of interacting with each other. Our ability to provide service is dependent on our relationships with our publics and the communities in which we are situated, which we serve and from which we draw our strength and capacity are themselves diverse. We will do a better job in this important aspect of our mission if our faculty more closely reflect the communities that we hope to serve and with whom we hope to engage. So in the next few slides, we'll present information about underrepresented faculty and faculty of color and American Indian faculty more generally. We focus first on underrepresented groups as defined here, drawing attention especially to those groups whose representation among our faculty is lower than it is in the general United States or Minnesota census. Uh, we focus on U.S. domestic diversity here while recognizing the importance of international diversity as well, which, though you don't have that information in your docket or these materials, it stands at about 5.3%. It's important to separate out these groups to ensure that we are accurately understanding our challenges and our progress in relation to faculty diversity. So this slide demonstrates that for underrepresented groups, the percentage of our faculty is lower than the percentage of our undergraduate and graduate students and lower than the U.S. Census. In total, while about one-third of the U.S. population is comprised of these groups, only 6.1% of our faculty are from these groups. This slide compares our faculty to both the U.S. Census and the percentage of these four groups in Minnesota. Underrepresented faculty at the university are less than half of what we would expect if we mirrored um, the population throughout the university, or throughout the Minnesota community, and less than one fifth of what we would expect if we mirrored the United States. Now, we recognize that the disparities that we present here 
um, are reflective of, of disparities at earlier points in the pipeline as well. So yes, we need to pay attention to recruiting and retaining faculty at the university. We also need to be thinking about our efforts earlier in the pipeline to make sure that there are people prepared to join our faculty. So it's important to note too that there is substantial variability among our colleges and campuses as related to both underrepresented faculty and the larger group of faculty of color and American Indians. With this graph, we focus on that variability across the university, noting that different contexts might call for unique strategies then. This slide demonstrates the change in the last 13 years of our underrepresented faculty. Between 2010 and 2018, the underrepresented group has grown from 5.2% of our total faculty population to 6.1%. In that same period, it's instructive to know that these groups in the US Census have grown from 30 to 33.2%. This slide also shows that the majority of the increase of faculty of color in American Indians over the last 13 years has been among groups outside those traditionally underrepresented at the university. We are now at approximately 20% when we look at the more inclusive category of faculty of color in American Indian faculty. This expanded group includes Asian Americans who, while not underrepresented numerically, certainly include many subgroups, which may be underrepresented. So racial and ethnic groups are, of course, an important dimension of diversity. And there are others that are also important, such as ability status, sexual orientation, religion, gender. For each of these, the data that we have available to us are limited. We do not ask about prospective faculty members' ability, status, sexual orientation, religion, or political ideology when we are hiring them. We are more likely, though, to attract a more diverse faculty along these lines when we actively promote a climate that is inclusive and accepting of multiple identities and experiences. So this slide reports on the sex of our faculty using the binary categories of female and male. While we also have a way of collecting data regarding gender, that system is not widely used. While faculty, staff, and students can now identify themselves in the MyU portal by selecting from among seven genders or by entering their own, most people have not yet entered this information. So if we want to report in a comprehensive way in this category, we continue to use binary data associated with the sex assigned at birth while recognizing the limitations of that approach. This slide draws from those data. And in a way similar to the earlier slides, we can see that our colleges are quite different in terms of their percentages of female and male faculty. And these data show the change in percentage of female faculty over the last years. And while we're moving toward parity, we're doing so slowly, as you can see. When considering faculty diversity, it's important to consider how rank and then the associated opportunities associated with those ranks affect the potential influence and leadership opportunities of underrepresented faculty to enrich our research, teaching, and service. So at this point, Associate Vice Provost Keisha Varma will discuss some of the strategies that we're using to improve faculty diversity. Great, thank you. So I will start by briefly summarizing a few programs that illustrate our efforts to retain American Indian faculty and faculty of color. The Multicultural Research Awards fund interdisciplinary <coughs> projects that focus on underrepresented communities and issues related to diversity and equity. Applications for these awards are invited system-wide from all university faculty members who hold tenure and tenure track appointments. These awards contribute to efforts to increase our representational diversity by focusing on funding American Indian faculty and faculty of color who are assistant professors. This year, we have been working with Associate Vice President for Research, Francis Lorenz, and were able to increase the award amounts from $10,000 to $25,000 so that faculty can truly make progress in their scholarship. The MRA, MRA Award recipients present their work at the Diversity Through the Discipline Symposium and also at the annual Diversity Breakfast in the Gallery of Excellence. These programs contribute to our efforts to retain American Indian faculty and faculty of color by supporting and highlighting their scholarship. The Keeping Our Faculty Symposium is one of the ways that we build institutional capacity around diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is a two-day meeting that provides a space for academic leaders, 
administrators, and faculty from our university and universities around the country to share practical experiences and scholarly knowledge focused on recruitment and retention for American Indian faculty and faculty of color. Then ideas and experiences shared at the meeting can be translated into programmatic and policymaking agendas. Now I'd like to transition to talk about some of our newer programs. The President's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program is the outgrowth of a long-standing University of California initiative that encourages outstanding PhD recipients from underrepresented groups to pursue academic careers. In 2017, the University of Minnesota was invited to join a distinguished network of partner institutions, including universities like Stanford University, University of Michigan, and the 10 campus University of California system. Being a member of this program has been a way for us to attract talented, highly sought after researchers to our campuses. The application process involves a collaborative effort from college deans, department chairs and heads, and faculty members <coughs> to consider their strategic hiring plans and their diversity plans as they recruit applicants and review applications. So throughout the process, they're considering not only having a postdoctoral scholarship who's temporarily in their units, but they're also considering whether or not this individual could transition into a tenure track faculty position following the end of their fellowship. If you look at the table on this slide, you can see the number of applications we've had in the first two years of the pro first three years of the program, actually, and um, the number of fellows we've been able to recruit in the first two years. So in year one, which was 2018-19, we had six fellows. In the current year, which is year two, we have seven. So four of the fellows from the first year <laughs> elected to continue for a second year. Two were hired for tenure track positions, and we, we recruited three more. So while these numbers might seem kind of modest, they're actually in line with what we see from other institutions who have been in this program for much longer than the University of Minnesota. So for example, UC Berkeley currently has 10 fellows, UCLA has five, and University of Michigan has three. The next program is more of a resource that we're leveraging to enhance campus climate and support faculty retention. The National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity focuses on helping academics achieve writing and research productivity and maintain a healthy work-life balance. The university has an institutional membership, and that means that all faculty have free access to individual memberships that include access to online resources, discussion groups, writing challenges, and multi-week professional development courses. We're leveraging our membership in a couple of ways. Um, recently, actually earlier this week, we just hosted um, an on-site workshop where we planned for 20 to 30 faculty members to come together to work on uh, establishing a publishing pipeline. This workshop was designed specifically for our campus, and what happened was we had over 120 faculty members come. Some of faculty drove in from our system campuses, and we had a live video feed to the system campuses so that they, they could participate in that way as well. The College Made Multicultural Access, Diversity, and Equity Initiative is led by Associate Vice Provost Varajita Singh in the Office for Equity and Diversity. College Made provides individual colleges with data-driven approaches to increase represent representational diversity, improve campus climate, and create partnerships to grow diversity, equity, and inclusive excellence across our Twin Cities campus. Through College Made, Academic leaders attend consultative meetings where they review employment engagement and SERU data at the college level so that they can develop more targeted strategies to build on strengths and find opportunities for growth. This is currently a capacity building initiative that hopes to be expanded to our system campuses. The Climate Support Network is a new initiative that emerged out of the President's Initiative to Prevent Sexual Misconduct. Our campus community recognizes that marginalization and harassment happen along many dimensions of identity and experience. Therefore, the Climate Support Network will have a broader focus as it, as it explores ways to strengthen the overall campus climate for faculty, students, and staff in academic units. 
As we move forward, we plan to collaborate with faculty to seek external funding from the National Science Foundation's advanced program to support faculty diversity initiatives. This particular um, program focuses on recruiting female faculty in STEM disciplines, but what happens is universities get this funding and then they develop um, strategies, initiatives, and institutionalize those and expand them to include other diversity and equity initiatives. As we do that, we'll look for national models that we can build on to broaden our pathways to faculty diversity, and we'll be sure that we are emphasizing the unique college and disciplinary goals that are present so that we can make sure that we're meeting college level needs. So I've just summarized some of our broader initiatives, and now you'll hear about work being done in the College of Biological Sciences. Thank you, Chair Powell, members of the board. Uh, thank you. I just have a couple of slides to show some specific examples of what we're doing at the college level to enhance faculty diversity. Um, next, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, first, I want to say that in CBS, we don't have a diversity officer or committee. We believe that diversity is all of our responsibility and that we try to embed it in everything that we do. Um, and in keeping with our role as scientists, we believe strongly in using an evidence and data-driven approach to inform the various initiatives that we take. So what we've basically done is start with the university-wide policies and practices and tailor them to meet our own needs and get buy-in and um, uh, develop initiatives that are relevant for our own specific college. So to give you some specific examples, I should mention that uh, in our compact process, we list the top strategic priorities for the college and uh, diversity, increasing diversity at all levels is one of our top priorities that we discuss with the university leadership, uh, which we just did last week in our compact. Uh, I'll mention briefly the bottom bullet on preventing sexual misconduct. We established, I established and chaired a task force last year that was about creating an inclusive and welcoming environment focused largely on our faculty, grad students, and postdoctoral scholars. I'm not going to say more about that, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So focusing on the faculty recruitment and retention piece, uh, we in CBS have been very strong advocates for the university to join this president's postdoctoral fellowship program that Keisha talked about. Uh, we've just hired our second fellow in this program and are really excited that it's going to um, really have an impact. Slow, but it will have an impact, I think. We have taken... Um, a lot of opportunity for what we call no search hires. So these are hires that um, are not planned and budgeted for, but either they involve often spousal accommodations. So you, you re, um, recruit for a position and then you find out that person has a spouse who's also an academic. Um, and we've um, negotiated a number of those uh, spousal dual, dual career hires and also what we call opportunity hires. And we had one recently where a, an underrepresented uh, minority faculty member applied for a position in CSE. The department head there said, you know, this person isn't quite a good fit for the, the, the position we advertise, but they would be a really good fit for CBS. And the department head in CBS approached me and I said, let's do it. Now, in that case, you haven't budgeted for this position. And I will say the provost's office has been a really great partner in helping us um, provide a financial bridge to help those unfunded projects until, you know, retirements kick in and, and we can actually fund these. Um, during the recruitment process for faculty, uh, my associate dean for faculty, uh, Marlene Zook, who you'll recognize as one of our newest National Academy members and Regents professor, is also really passionate about faculty diversity, and she's been an extremely uh, strong partner in being proactive. Um, so when we advertise faculty positions, she sends a memo out to the top candidates which mentions our family-friendly policies, which allows them to talk about any spousal issues or other issues they might have, so we can be ready to negotiate if and when that top candidate receives an offer. And since she's not directly involved in the search decision, she's sort of an independent party that they can feel safe talking about, uh, talking with. Uh, of course, all of our search committees have bias, are required to have bias training. Um, which involves various uh, um, 
skills and, and other things. We have very, in, we make effort to put inclusive language in our job ads. We take care in who's represented on the search committees. Um, and we expect the search committees to report back to the dean on the efforts that they took to ensure a diverse candidate pool. And on the final slide, there's just some language. This is from uh, a current uh, job ad. Our Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior is in a leadership transition. The department head is retiring, and we're uh, doing an international search for a new head. I won't read all of this text here, but these are excerpts from the job ad that we posted, just to give you a sense of the kind of language that we're using to attract uh, a diverse group of candidates. So I think I will end there and open the floor for questions. Okay, Dr. Go, are you happy to turn it over for the two yes. board member questions? Well, thank you, thank you, presenters. For I mean, it's a very um, full and comprehensive overview of activities. So um, with that, um, uh, we'll open it up. And I know that uh, 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 Regent Simonson would like to leave us. Thank off. you, Chair. Thank you, presenters. Just a couple of comments and then a couple of questions. Um, I, I really appreciate the uh, broad definition of diversity. For example, uh, uh, diversity of experiences, because this is my alma mater and I've experienced where experience wasn't there in faculty at times. So I really, really appreciate that broad, uh, broad definition. Um, and, and so, but with regards to underrepresented faculty, uh, in, in that sense, um, the, uh, I had the opportunity the other night to go to the uh, Bell Museum to uh, see the uh, documentary Black in Space. It was on like, Wednesday night and, and uh, <clears throat> breaking down the color barrier. And it was really eye-opening. Even though it kind of ended in the 1970s, I don't think a lot of things haven't changed to date. So it was really an eye-opening. It's going to be coming out of the Smithsonian at the end of the month. I'd recommend watching it if you can. But <clears throat> with that in mind, um, how are you, a couple of quick questions, um, uh, how, given this focus, which I'm in favor of, uh, very much in favor of, how are you going to uh, um, answer questions about reverse discrimination, for example, in that process? How are you going to cover that? And then the second one, um, uh, somebody was talking to me the other day about some recent news, I don't know what was in the, what, Washington Post or something about tuition assistance to illegal immigrants. I hate that term. But there was something on national news about that concern. Uh, and somebody called me the other day about my thoughts about that. And, uh, so I don't know if that's something to look at or not. So those are just my two questions and my comments. Thank you. I, I will. Um... Chair Powell, Regent Simonson, thank you for the question. I, I think we might have to get back to you on the second um, question for which I don't have enough information. Um, and I welcome uh, additional comments from uh, my colleagues regarding the first. I think it's important, I remind myself that the, the concept of diversity in higher education is, is not a current trend. It's a 1973, I think, Baki um, uh, Supreme Court decision on the value of, of diversity. And, and even more recently, is it 2005, um, Justice O'Connor's uh, majority judgment around this is not theoretical, this is realistic, that, that, that we want to ensure that there's representational diversity in higher education in order to ensure you know, guarantee an experience for our students that is optimal. Um, so, so that's, I think, the foundation for which we try to, the reason we, we have census, we have try to reflect the demographics, we try to recruit for that faculty diversity as well. Um, so I'm not sure I would frame it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Chair Powell, Regent Simonson, the only thing I would say is that um, I, I think that what we are aiming for is to create an excellent learning experience 
And so what we're not trying to do is to discriminate against anybody. What we're trying to do is to create learning environments, research environments that can be as, as excellent as possible. And that requires an inclusive approach that does not systematically shut people out from either coming as a student or as a staff member or, or as a faculty member to participate in, in creating that. And I think if we look historically, we will see that we have systematically shut people out from participating in those ways. Okay, thank you. Um, Regent Sweet. Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, Dr. Rowe. Thank you for anticipating all my questions, if I can throw them away. Um, I think my question is one of uh, competition. Um, my guess is this. My guess is uh, uh, that this is a very, very important aspect that we need to enhance, hiring faculty of color, hiring faculty of uh, Native American background, hiring faculty of conservative background. But my guess is also that Colorado, uh, Madison, and Maryland are in the same boat we are on. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to guess that. And if there's a great researcher out there uh, in the chemical engineering, chemical area, uh, that researcher, we want her. But my guess is Colorado wants her too. Mm -hmm. And if there's a great cons uh, person out there who uh, is in journalism, you know, Wisconsin wants him and we want him. What's our barrier to getting that person over Wisconsin or Maryland or Texas or Colorado? Uh, what can we do special to get that person here? Not, not just to fill boxes and to fill quotas, but you know, the other schools are doing the same thing. Yes. Uh -huh. They're not just recruiting football players, they're recruiting faculty of color. Right. So what's our biggest barrier? What can we do to help in um, in that effort, can I can I try that one? I, you're right. Everyone is trying to do this. Not just the institutions you name across the board in higher ed. Everybody appreciates that a diverse faculty um, increases excellent and increases student success. This is one of the reasons I'm excited about this postdoctoral uh, fellowship program because. We feel that there may be really excellent applicants out there, new PhDs, who might not think about coming to Minnesota for a faculty position, which seems like a forever commitment, but they might be willing to come here as a postdoc for a couple years, and then they get here and find out how much they love it and want to stay. That's, that's you know, one of the hopes here. Other comments, please, Dr. Governor. Chair Powell, thank you, and Chair um, Regent Swiggum, thank you. If I can add some comments, I think we're finding a lot of our strategy um, involves educating search committees uh, from, from how job descriptions signal uh, the importance and the welcome that we want for certain identities to, to join our community to the ways we interact through our emails, through our on-campus interviews, through how we host them matters. I think we had recent candidates for a senior level position on our campus admit, I, I call it confess, all three of them confess that they have actually poached our faculty. And that, that affirms every the statement that they're all trying to find the same talent because this vision we have for enhancing faculty diversity is a, is a vision that many universities share. Uh, I will. I would and, uh, guess, Dr. Go, every university shares that. I yes. Mean, including the state of Mankato. Uh, yes. Mankato State or whatever. I think, and, and maybe deans can speak more um, specifically to this, but I, I think sometimes with certain universities with different endowments, okay. um, salaries become a barrier as well. And we do our best to compete, um, and, and, and it's different in different disciplines, but sometimes um, we lose the fight. But, but we need to be prepared. For the fight. What is inherent in your question, but maybe not explicitly asked, uh, I'd like to offer a comment as well. I think part of our education to our colleagues, uh, specifically college leadership, is this notion that once we get some of these faculty on our campuses, we need to re-recruit them every single day. Otherwise, they, they, we know that they will be, and they are being recruited from the day they arrive to consider post-tenure, in the middle of their tenure, 
um, a, a better package, bet, better weather. <laughs> um, so we need to do our work, and hence the, the, the connection with campus climate matters so much. Mr. Chairman, just a quick one. I could just finish, and I, I appreciate the comment about recruiting every day. I, we, we just all need to be a, aware of it and supportive. I appreciate the comment about the postdoctoral program. If you have other ideas, other things come forward, or if there's something that we should uh, steal from what Colorado is doing or Utah is doing or whatever, you bring it forward to us if you would. You know, other people got good ideas too that are probably being successful. If I could just reply quickly to that, one thing that has shown success, particularly when you start off with very low numbers of certain groups that you want to increase, no one wants to be the first of whatever underrepresented group. So if you can get above a critical mass, it becomes easier to attract more people. So things like cluster hires, where you hire a group of faculty and then you, then you can provide a community for them to help with the mentoring and the retention can also be effective. Let's start. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Regent Davenport. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you. Um, I want to echo my appreciation for the work that you're doing and the intentionality that you do it with. And just um, as an example and a shout out to the Keeping Our Faculty Conference, that um, I went to that first one, and I think it was maybe one of the first in the country. Uh, and it's grown, and to see that existing, and I don't want to date myself, so I know it was a long time ago, but I think that reflects the kind of leadership we want to represent the university, and that uh, Regent Swiggum is going to drive the desire to be here mm -hmm. at the University of Minnesota, so thank you. Okay, uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good, good comments, and thank you for the presentation. Um, no, picking up off of uh, Regent Sigum's comments, you know, it's not just I mean, it's every everybody looking for PhDs. It's not just educational institutions, and and and, and quite frankly, there are you know a lot of great options and and different lifestyles and other things that may um, dictate that. It, I mean, it really is the challenge of you know um, a supply. Issue and and you know it's 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 a little bit like being the only city that that engages in environmental cleanup um, if everyone around you is still billowing black smoke you know and ultimately we end up if if we're successful hopefully others will adopt the model and start to uh, produce a, a a a better environment for more people from different uh, backgrounds uh, to 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 earn the credentials necessary I mean it's it's the 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 Credentials challenge, I think, in, in 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 so many ways, and getting people on that path, and 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 ensuring that they have the support and the understanding that that isn't an opportunity for them, and it's something that they'll be successful at. I think that's really important. When we look at the data, and you know, this is I understand on faculty um, specifically. I mean, when we talk about students, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting, and I'm not, I don't want to throw this out as a you know kind of let's let's take our efforts for diversity and start talking about uh, you know the the, the counter arguments. Um, but you know we're now I, I don't know if we're approaching 53 or 54 percent of our student body is is um, are women and you know I have yet to hear you know a, a concern about um, what, what's happening why are why are boys not now looking to a, a, attend an institution like the university I don't know that we've reached that I think if those numbers were reversed and that was the trend we would certainly be concerned that that girls are being discouraged and, and, and you know at what point in time is that a conversation but within the faculty you know, do we understand this in, at a level of granularity? Um, my expectations when I look at these numbers, and they're they're certainly improving over you know, historical numbers, but are we are, are there still certain programs that we're relying on to sort? You know, there, are there? You can go at the college level, you can go at the campus level, college level, department level. I, my presumption that there are some issues, some things where preference actually plays a role, and that in this particular area we see far more women. Um, where you might have a, depart a department that's 80% women, well, that sort of masks the fact that in another area you may have a very small percentage of women. And I, and we, without going into which ones, we, we sort of have historically seen that way. Um, by the same token, you will, when you look at, at those areas and you say, well, in this area, is there anything that excludes men from being interested in going into this area? That's why we have 80% or more uh, women. Do we understand this at a level of granularity that we don't, you know, sort of, expect this college or this department to meet our female uh, numbers and then we don't worry about the rest of them or are we really very 
uh, deliberate about every area to ensure that we're not living with barriers that prevent people from pursuing um, careers in those areas that bring the kind of diversity and, and different ways of thinking that people with different backgrounds and experiences would bring. Uh, Chair Powell, Regent Rosha, there's a lot to that question. <laughs> um, and I, I guess what I'm, I'm thinking about is perhaps we can take the, the example of gender in CSE where women are, uh, this is not unique to the University of Minnesota at all. Um, the low representation of women has been seen as a national problem that, that, uh, that makes it difficult to have the research accomplishments, the research uh, goals that we would like to have nationally. And so there are national efforts to try to um, enhance and address women's involvement in, in CSE. I think, we, we have to be careful, or I would like to suggest that we would, we would be careful when we think about preferences because I would suggest that in society our preferences are somewhat constructed for us. In other words, when we see people represented or not represented in a given field, then we can think about whether or not we in whatever, whatever identities we characterize or, or, or carry could see ourselves in that path if there's nobody else there. Um, and so I may choose not to become a member of CSE or any other field because I don't think that that's a possibility for me. And so that's, it's just something to think about when we're thinking about preferences and choices because those choices are the, are really constructed and, and are reflected in, in the numbers here. Again, I want to underscore though, in no way is the University of Minnesota unique in its challenges of representation, whether racially, ethnically, gender, or in many other ways. I don't know if that gets to your question. No, Mr. I, I think that's a, it, it, it kind of takes it in a very specific direction versus sort of more, I was talking more kind of analytical, you know, how we are able to assess these things. But it does, it, it does bring up the question, you know, do we operate under the presumption that all preference is constructed? Or, are, I mean, what, what is it that, and, and when is it good, when is it bad? And that's a really, really deep, you know, mm -hmm. meet you over to O'Gara's type. Well, O'Gara's is closed now. But anyway, um, but you know, it's it's a it's a huge question and, and one that I don't know that anybody has captured the answer to. But we continue as a society. Again, my my approach is barriers. Get rid of the barriers. Let people mm -hmm. start to pursue, and then we can start looking at some of these other things. But I appreciate the answer. Dean Forbes. So, Chair Powell, um, Regent Rocha, thank you for the question. So, I can say that in CBS, our incoming freshmen now are about 67 percent female. Our grad students, it's about 50-50, and our faculty is about 30 percent female. So, there, there's still something there. We are looking at these sorts of questions in our Department of Biology, Teaching, and Learning. So, for example, um, we find that courses that rely on very high stakes exams tend to disfavor female students, um, regardless of their, their grasp of the content. And that's a very concrete example of something that our faculty are doing in the classroom that when you look at the evidence, it's disfavoring a certain group of students. And so if we can change what we're doing in the classroom, we may be able to help all students succeed better. So yes, we're looking at that. Do we have all the answers yet? No. So. Thank you. So we just have, a, we'll have a few more here and I want to keep us on schedule, but um, so uh, Regent Kenyana, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, presenters. Um, Vice President Gold made a point about how we have to re-recruit faculty. I think we should re-recruit regions. Wisconsin's been giving me some calls. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to highlight something that uh, I think Vi uh, Vice Provost Roper's uh, brought out. And, and I think you were making a comment about how one of the constraints is some of the constraints are happening earlier in the pipeline. Um, that, that you, you know, to I think maybe Regent Rocha's point about supply, and you know that that made me think of the conversation we had yesterday when Associate Vice Provost Barma was and uh, Vice Provost McMaster were presenting, and, and we saw the graduation gaps. Um, and you know, clearly, if if we're not graduating students of color, who are you going to hire? And if the high schools aren't graduating, then who are we going to admit? Um, so I, I just, that point stuck out, and I just wanted to highlight how interrelated all these things are. But uh, thank you for the presentation and for the work. Uh, Regent Kenyanya, we're going to offer you a 20% raise. Thank <laughs> you. I'll have my lawyers. <laughs> Regent McMillan. 
Thank you, Chair Powell. In uh, your remarks and in President uh, Gable's remarks, you both referenced the session we had over uh, over lunch yesterday that uh, Provost Hansen facilitated with three faculty members focused exclusively on outreach. And in the middle of that discussion, we talked a little bit about challenges that a faculty, an, a tenure track faculty member might have engaging in outreach because it takes time and it isn't always something they do early in a career. And here's my question. Thinking about outreach as a way that we might differentiate ourselves as a university committed to that and that, you know, beyond research, we have this, this land grant mission. Are there strategies around telling either incoming associate of uh, assistant professors on tenure tracks or maybe it's hiring associate and full professors who are engaged in that, that this is a university that cares about that and that will reward you scholarship in the sense of outreach, you know, that it's not always published. And, and I don't know whether that makes sense, but it feels like what I saw yesterday is, you know, we're, we're differentiating ourselves in that space, both in Minnesota and perhaps broader. And I wonder if we might use that as a recruiting advantage. Chair Powell, Regent McMillan, I'd like to respond to that. Um, this last year, with a, with a concrete example, this last year, Associate Vice President uh, Andy Furco and I pulled together what's called an Engaged Scholar Review Committee, where we're offering people who are going up for promotion and tenure, either at the associate to the associate level or to the full professor level, an opportunity to get an, an extra review by people who are themselves distinguished engaged scholars at the university. Um, this review is intended to both signal valuing of engaged work, which as you mentioned, might take different types of time commitment, frankly, might have different kinds of products coming out of that, that work too, and indicate to the university community that we in fact do value that. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're um, upholding the quality standards that we have at the University of Minnesota. And so we're, we're incorporating that into the review process in, um, in a meaningful and systematic way. Thus far, last year we had four people go through that, and this is only the second year where we're, we're offering that. All right. Um, well, pre presenters, thanks to you for a um, very good presentation and a very, very good discussion. This is uh, very important to us. And uh, we look forward to a continuing conversation with you. And, and we and we need you know we'll need to see progress on these. The numbers don't lie. The metrics are important. And uh, so we're uh, we're very hopeful that your efforts will pay dividends and we'll see these numbers improve. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we will turn now to the outreach discussion uh, that I mentioned. Um, uh, earlier uh, uh, in the morning um, to lead us through this discussion. I'd like to welcome Provost Hansen, Vice President Kramer, Associate Vice President Furco. Uh, they will take us through um, uh, this work. And uh, President Gable, would you like to make a few comments? Yes, thank you, Chair Powell. Um, so just as a reminder, coming out of last July's retreat in Faribault, the board established outreach as a 2019-20 priority particularly charging the administration to define, articulate, and promote the university's outreach mission and develop a system-wide plan to articulate its impact. At the September meeting, I updated you on efforts to inventory this important work, and in October, I shared with you our plan to define outreach, which we've adapted from the Carnegie Foundation's National Best Practice Definition of Community Engagement, and this will be refined to highlight the University of Minnesota's unique qualities, including our distinction as a land-grant institution steeped in discovery and impact. And in October, I also shared with you my charge to Matt Kramer, our VP of University Relations, to develop a plan to quantify and articulate the university's outreach and engagement efforts, including the development of an interactive web application, which highlights these efforts across every county in the state. At our meeting in December, I presented a snapshot of this work through Vice President Kramer, which is highlighted by an interactive, what we've called MPACT web application. So over the last two months, this effort has grown vastly in depth and reach as our teams have worked to populate the map with more data, keeping in mind that each point of data is the kind of deep commitment we heard from some of our faculty over lunch yesterday and at dinner last night 
and deep and in some cases multi-year strategies as advanced by Andy Furco's office. So they're here today together to discuss this work further, joined by Executive Vice President and Provost Karen Hansen, so that we can look at our university's statewide impact, including through our core mission, as well as through effective communication and messaging. So now I will turn it over to them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell, Vice, Vice Chair Spigum, and uh, President Gable, and members of the board. Uh, the, the President just um, herself articulated the kind of two foci that it's important to remember we're going to have in, in, in this session. Um, the title is Outreach Articulating the, the University Statewide Impact, and uh, as we've noted, um, Associate Vice President Furco, who's from the Office of Public Engagement, and Vice President Kramer, University and Government Relations, are going to be talking about two different aspects of, of the notion of articulation. Um, that's a word, you know, articulating that really has two senses, and they were kind of um, touched on in the President's introduction. You know, two senses of articulating, one which involves speaking clearly, um, communicating understandably, and the other sense of, of articulating, setting things in line, you know, kind of joining them, uh, forming a joint, connecting, articulating two sides of a, of a box you're constructing or something like that. Um, there's a way in which I, I think it'll help you um, have a sense of, of the, the the presentation today, if you see Associate Vice President Furco emphasizing the second, how we set things in line or join or connect in that sense of articulating, and Vice President Kramer talking about the first, how we speak clearly or communicate understandably uh, the statewide impact. Uh, as Chair Powell noted in, in talking about uh, yesterday's uh, luncheon, and, and Regent McMillan mentioned this too with uh, some faculty, and, and talked about the, the um, dinner with the um, Research and Outreach Center directors and the people from Cedar Creek. We, we've had uh, over a lot of yesterday and uh, in the past a lot of conversations and examples on how and where we connect. Uh, how we connect the university's expertise with the public's uh, concerns in order to address <coughs> mutually delineated problems and issues. And that's kind of what the focus was yesterday, how we do that, where some examples are, uh, and that again is this uh, sense of connecting or joining, or articulating in that way. And I hope, uh, I hope, I mean, what some of the things you said indicated that those things have been producing a feel for those varied ways in which we engage now um, at the level of the... The system has detected that a minimum number of lines are connected to this conference. Connecting again. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> we connect the university, we connect our various campuses, our various departments, schools, even particular faculty and staff with issues that the public is concerned about. Um, we have various metrics and some of that has been uh, uh, presented in the dockets and Vice um, uh, Provost Roper's just talked about another way in which we're, we're talking about our modes of tracking those forms of engagement. And the next steps, and I think this was something that really came out in your discussion with the faculty yesterday, is to think about how to prioritize those directions, which foci we want to say are particularly important. So they're going to kind of uh, get the university lined up. That is both a top down and a bottom up process. What are the faculty doing? Where are their strengths? What does the state need? What does the board particularly want the university to be doing in moving in certain directions? Um, some of that is emerging in all in these discussions that the president is leading on the system-wide uh, strategic plan. It's there in commitment three, this goal that's connected with the notion of intersections. Where does the state fit with the university's expertise and what does it want out of the university? And it's certainly there in her commitment to the third goal about engaging with the state. So, we're going to be having, again, a bifurcated discussion today with Associate Vice President Furco talking about that notion of connecting or joining, that kind of articulating, and Vice President Kramer talking about 
um, the communication about the work of, of uh, the uh, University of Minnesota. And, and they're talking about the impact that we have through these, uh, the various things we do, the, both the, the so-called measles map that the president just referenced and the, um, I think again of that wonderful video spot that the, that uh, Vice President Kramer's office has done showing, you know, the person going through a day and being impacted in various ways by the, by the things the university has done. You know, they eat a honey crisp apple, they put on their seat belt, they go to the airport and the uh, black box is in the airplane. You know, they, all of the things that the university creates and the way in which it touches lives. But so there are, again, just to kind of frame up the things that, that these two folks are going to be talking about. We've got on the one hand the actual way of articulating our work with the public, and then the second is communicating that we're doing that. So uh, I think Andy's going to start. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Powell, members of the board, President Gable, good morning. Our presentation is going to focus on, as, as, as Provost uh, Hansen mentioned, on defining outreach and engagement, describing how we're tracking this work and how we are demonstrating and articulating the impact to the state. You know, as we all know, the University of Minnesota has a long-standing commitment to serving the public good through our social contract with the state. Every day, our faculty, our students, our, our staff, our colleges, our campuses, our centers are immersed across the state making a difference in addressing a broad range of critical issues facing Minnesota and beyond, as is demonstrating the examples presented in the public engagement impact report that was included in the docket, uh, linked in the docket materials. The, University's, the University of Minnesota's strategic commitment to advancing and institutionalizing outreach and engagement across our mission and across our system has been recognized nationally through the designation of two of our campuses, Twin Cities and Morris, as Carnegie Classified Community Engagement Campuses. And I, and I know that others, aspire that, to have the University of Minnesota be the first university system in the nation to have all of its campuses designated as such, and I think we're well on our way. The outreach and engagement work across the system thrives today because of the intentional institutional commitments that have been made in recent years to elevate the importance of outreach, including the work that the Board of Regents has done and continues to do to make university community partnerships a more integral part of all aspects of the university's mission to serve the public good. And I think it's fair to say that there is some confusion over terms such as outreach, public service, public engagement, and the like. Uh, these terms uh, are used interchangeably, but they have nuanced and distinct meanings and serve different purposes. And I think it's worth taking a brief moment to clarify the, the definitions and characteristics of these various terms and how we engage with the public uh, through different ways. Um, as this, as this uh, typology shows, the university engages with the public in a variety of ways, and these are some of the uh, four of the more common ways, all of which serve important purposes. As the top row shows, this is about public participation with the public interfacing with the university through its university-sponsored events, concerts, athletic events, etc. This is what sometimes is referred to as in-reach, public in-reach. And as the arrow we see signifies this idea of the public coming to the university to access its resources as a way that we engage with the public. Uh, in terms of the second row, neighborhood interaction, this has to do with the fact that each of our campuses has a physical presence in a neighborhood or a set of neighborhoods. And each of our campuses uh, influences uh, the development and overall character of that surrounding neighborhood. We sometimes call this, town, this type of interaction uh, neighborhood interaction, neighborhood engagement, town-gown relations. And the arrow suggests the directions in which those interactions and exchanges occur in reach and outreach work. And these exchanges and interactions are certainly important for securing positive relationships with our neighbors. And you can see the kinds of things that uh, we tend to uh, focus on in, those, in that kind of engagement. Another kind of, a different way that the university engages, 
engage with the public is through the kind of outreach work that Vice President Kramer's University Relations Office conducts which involves communicating with the public the stories, the data about the relevance, the value, the impact of the university's work on the state and beyond. And Vice President Kramer will present on this in just a moment, as uh, uh, Provost Hansen mentioned. A different way that the university engages with, with the public, the way with which the office I oversee is most closely associated, is about the ways our faculty, our students, our academic units, and various centers and institutes fulfill the university's contract to serve the public good through the delivery of the university's mission of research, teaching, and outreach. This work speaks to advancing the public-facing aspects of the university mission, which is typically referred to as the outreach mission, distinct from the university's teaching and research missions. However, as is clearly stated in the University of Minnesota's system-wide mission statement, not yet, um, Serving the public is a goal that is embedded in all three parts of the university's mission, suggesting that the public impact potential of the university's work should be considered, regardless of whether the primary nature of the work is research, teaching, or outreach. So the notion there is that the serving the public good is not just part of the outreach mission. It's also embedded in the definition of our research and our teaching missions. To this end, university's outreach agenda in recent years has focused on deepening the achievement of the public impact goal within and across all aspects of the university's mission. With this has come greater attention to engaging our faculty, our students, our academic units in deeper partnerships with external stakeholders, both public and private, in ways that the expertise and experience of the public are joined, as Provost Hansen mentioned, with the expertise and experiences of the university to co-create and co-produce solutions that benefit our state and beyond. This approach calls for the university's public outreach work to be built on mutually beneficial, reciprocal partnerships, as is signified by the curved arrows. Here we go back. Oops, sorry. There we go, as signified by these curved arrows. So moving away from this unidirectional approach that is termed outreach to this more reciprocal notion that we call engagement. This approach to university outreach is what the university has termed public engagement. In 2005, the Board of Regents adopted this definition for public engagement. And as this definition articulates, our outreach work is about university and external stakeholders, both public and private, working in partnership to advance the public good, while also benefiting and enriching our scholarship, our research, curriculum, teaching, and the preparation of future, uh, students for the future. To this end, the idea behind public engagement is to deepen the public impact of our university's work through mutually beneficial partnerships with external entities and by distributing that public impact work across and throughout all parts of our mission. As was mentioned in the docket, a system-wide 10-point public engagement institutionalization plan has guided the university's internal work to advance its public engagement goal, and there are also established campus-wide action plans toward this effort. These plans address the challenges and barriers to integrating outreach-focused work, as was mentioned in the previous discussion, around research and incorporating it in research and teaching. And these plans advance policies that support the external outreach agenda that individual units operationalize regarding the specific impacts that they foster for Minnesota based on the unit's respective areas of strength and expertise. Now, moving to the next set, uh, part of the presentation, which is about how we're measuring the scale and scope and impact of the university's broad-based outreach and engagement. And I should start off by saying that every university struggles with being able to easily and fully articulate the impact of its outreach and engagement efforts. As it was mentioned in the docket, there are some commercial systems available designed specifically to capture outreach data, but these systems have proven to be inadequate and, and quite costly. In light of this, our approach over the last few years has been to take advantage of existing data collection systems that the university has already invested in, and we have found ways to use these systems to embed public engagement and outreach-oriented items 
at, uh, in order to capture those data within those systems at significant cost savings. We have shared this in previous board meetings, so I won't go through uh, the full list, but for example, our faculty activity reports now ask faculty whether in their research they have public and community engagement work in their teaching, that these courses include community engagement, and we're able to capture those data now through those, that existing system. Similarly, when we submit a proposal now for research or for a sponsored project, we indicate whether it includes external entities, who are the external entities and what is their role. And we're able now to capture the, the depth and scope of what kinds of research and other sponsored projects we're having that have this public engagement focused agenda. And so on. Many units, departments, colleges, schools, uh, have their own data collection systems specific to the, their goals and outreach agendas as well. So uh, in concluding my portion, um, I, looking to the future, we continue to explore strategies more fully, looking at what other institutions are doing uh, and in order to capture uh, the impact across the state and beyond. One of the next steps is uh, incorporating this public engagement activities database into this new APHIS assessment management platform that the university has recently purchased. This will allow us to capture fuller descriptions of out outreach activities, populations and communities served, impact statements, and mapping of locations impacted. And those data can be interfaced with many other data points around students and faculty and other important aspects of our work. So Chair Powell, my colleague, Vice President Kramer, will now turn to the last part of the presentation and describe how we're communicating the university's impact to the public. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, Madam President, thank you for the opportunity to share with you how university relations, as the provost has noted, is are now articulating or communicating these values to Minnesotans. And Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, bonus points, and Regent Beeson, I thought you might comment on this. Um, Regent Rocha's uh, selection of a St. Paul bar for any gathering is much appreciated. So <laughs> as a committed St. Paulite, I found that extraordinarily powerful. Um, why do we do this? Because Understanding our impact and establishing connections with Minnesota is how we establish trust. And as all of us know, in any relationship, and the university has a relationship with 201 legislators and five and a half million Minnesotans, you start by building a trusted relationship. You demonstrate trust by showing impact and credibility. That is exactly what university relations does every day. We use multiple strategies to achieve that. You're familiar with the Driven to Discover marketing campaign. Our public relations professionals, both in our unit and across the system, place articles of interest on our faculty, staff, researchers, and students in area publications, regional, national, and in some cases international, as is applicable. And then finally, we have a variety of our own channels, both our homepage, our social media channels, and the wide variety of publications that the university produces. I'd like to take you through Driven to Discover very quickly because some of you may recall that in 2018, we recalibrated the Driven to Discover campaign to focus very specifically on value to Minnesotans. So we almost brought it back from the value of the University of Minnesota writ large to what are we doing for Minnesotans? Let's go back to our roots as to why we were chartered and why we're here. You will recall that in doing that, we selected based on survey results information or campaigns that Minnesotans valued, things like the quality of our water, health care, rural agriculture. Was it successful? Ladies and gentlemen, let me demonstrate that in 2005, we used our public opinion survey, a statistically significant survey using an outside survey firm, using statewide data to ask Minnesotans, does the U of M conduct research that improves the quality of life? 26% of Minnesotans said that that describes the university, and 47% of those Minnesotans said that was important to them. In 2018, look at the remarkable numbers. 69% of Minnesotans on the exact same question said, conducting research that improves quality of life describes the University of Minnesota, and 83% of those Minnesotans said, this is important to us. That is a remarkable achievement in building that connection with Minnesotans. I want to highlight two tools, one of which the president has mentioned. In 2019, University Relations launched a tool called Talking With. 
This was in recognition that for many greater Minnesota publications, the editor, reporter, photographer, and publisher is one person. They simply don't have the same capacity as a metropolitan newspaper. So Talking With takes a research project of note that is very focused on Minnesotans and turns it into five questions. And it's designed deliberately to be lifted from our publication, or our electronic publication, and put directly into an area newspaper. In 2019, we did 45 talking with, and as you'll see in the chart, 39 of these were placed in greater Minnesota publications, ranging from the Faribault Daily News, uh, Alexandria Echo, International Falls Journal. This was an extraordinarily deliberate and successful effort to share university impact in greater Minnesota publications. Members, I will also share with you, we're exploring how to also turn this into radio opportunities because one of the things we're very cognizant of, and you probably saw this in an NPR article a couple weeks ago, Greater Minnesota newspapers remain under extraordinary pressure, but Greater Minnesota radio is still doing very well. So I suspect that if we're successful, we will be able to take these talking with, turn them into a digital story, that then a local radio station can play saying, you know, we've interviewed Professor so-and-so, here are five questions and here's how they've answered it. As the president noted, in October, she tasked university relations was developing a visual way to show impact across the state of Minnesota. We asked communicators across the system to share with us results that they had that showed geographic specificity, that is, the researcher had locations they had been in in the state of Minnesota, but also, and very importantly, a link where interested people could learn more. So it wasn't enough to just say, I was in Alexandria or I was in Worthington. You needed an answer of, what did I do there? So a citizen could say, what is the University of Minnesota doing in our area? We collected this data in December, launched the tool, and now as a version one using Google Maps, a technology that we have full license to and that is commonly used across the internet, we are looking at ways to expand this. And I want to very briefly show you an example. We'll see if technology works here. <laughs> it did, and I... Excuse me. <laughs> well, it did on my Almost. screen. <laughs> Gotcha, thank you. Um, I hadn't heard the term measles map, but uh, I'm very appreciative of that. This is the state of Minnesota with a not comprehensive list of everything the University of Minnesota has done. And again, our deliberate attempt was, let's say you live in Park Rapids, Minnesota. So I'm gonna zoom in to Park Rapids. Park Rapids is, let's see, here we go. A town of approximately 3,700 people in Northern Minnesota. Huh. There are two different 4-H clubs. Oops, I'm gonna scroll up here too because I didn't wanna lose the name. The Dorset Snowy Owls, and I believe the Shell Prairie Gophers. <laughs> there is at the local healthcare clinic, U of M healthcare practitioners use this for their learning. If you happen to be stricken with cancer, this is a clinical cancer trial, courtesy of our Masonic Cancer Trial Center. There is a local individual who took training offered by Extension and sea fans in aquatic invasive species detection. And then finally, the University of Minnesota Extension Office has their uh, county headquarters here. If we go up to the lake, we have a U of M professor looking at walleye habitat assessment. And in 2017, individuals tested this lake for starry trek, an invasive species. Members, I could go in and out on this map all day long, but what you see is examples that we have collected, and I will fully admit on a very ad hoc basis, that demonstrate to Minnesotans the impact that the University of Minnesota has, not in a global, not in a statewide, but in a neighborhood perspective. And I find this to be an extraordinarily powerful way of helping Minnesotans see the value of the University of Minnesota, building that credibility, building that trust. With that, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe we turn it over for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, uh, presenters. And uh, I know we're going to have questions now, and uh, Regent Beeson will kick us off. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, um, I agree with um, um, Mr. Kramer. The, there is something to be said about a visual um, uh, in a map form when trying to describe um, what's really almost impossible to do that is it's really difficult to put a bow around this whole thing. And that's, I think, what the board, you know, um, ideally would like, but um, it, it, but at the, 
it's probably most effectively done through a visual than through uh, than through data. I'm going to go to Associate Vice President Burko on the on the on the um, data collection. I'm I'm not skeptical, but I'm concerned about. We've seen data collection used and failed and put on the credenza and how you create a survey instrument that's comprehensive enough but doesn't doesn't turn off the respondents um, and, and, you know because there's so many ways they can describe what their engagement is around the communities and 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 how much time are they going to be willing to spend are you going to have this a mandatory sort of response on their their research does without without incentives or penalties I, I'm I'm just I don't think we I know we're putting pressure on the uh, the staff to better quantify our outreach, but I but I don't want at the end of the day to have a a false start with a data collection system, um, and and so I'm just making that that point, Mr. Chair. And I know this is of great interest to you, and I think it's appropriate that we we're having this discussion. Response. Um, Chair Powell, Regent Beeson, thank you very much for that comment. Um, you're absolutely correct. It is very difficult to capture the scale and scope and depth of the work that's happening. And this is work that it evolves very quickly and changes very quickly. We have many starts and stops. And, um, and part of the complexity of this is to un disaggregate and unpack all the different dimensions. And when we've done a scan of what other universities are doing around collecting, these kinds of data and trying to tell the story and assess the impact of it. Um, what we have found is there are really two, uh, two pathways. One is to develop homegrown systems and a number of institutions have looked at capturing all the partnerships that they have uh, at, at their institution and so you get a list of 5,000 partnerships and those, that list is good for just a short period of time because those partnerships change and those data just sit there and they don't really um, mean a whole lot, and they're very difficult to digest. Um, the other the other mechanism has been to go with commercial systems, and a number of companies have developed these systems that capture engagement sp specifically around engagement and outreach data, making use of technology uh, in ways that uh, provide dashboards and other kinds of uh, data that and reports that are very useful. Um, at the same time, um, we have found those to be very costly, a lot of retraining that's involved. And so our approach over the last few years is to take a look at the existing systems and can we embed specific questions and items that can capture some important data points around outreach and engagement that we can begin to tell the story. And I'll give you a quick example. For example, with the sponsor projects, because of the items we've embedded into the proposal routing forms that are completed, we know, for example, that, um, uh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong thing here, uh, that uh, $1.2 billion in grants were submitted that had an outreach and public engagement component and almost 500 million were uh, garnered over the last four years. So part of this is we're starting to see, um, and we have a, a, a data on which, business, which businesses, what kinds of institutions, and so we're starting to collect these kinds of data, and all we had to do was just embed these items into in, in existing systems. We're not asking individuals to do something above and beyond necessarily. That's been our approach. Provost Hanson. Yeah, I, I just wanted to thank you, Chair Powell and um, uh, Regent Beeson. I, to to am, uh, amplify that or, or maybe just kind of uh, reiterate it, we, we, what we aim to do is not send out a survey to, uh, to faculty, but to, add, to make sure that on things that they do all the time anyway and have to do, like uh, proposal routing forms uh, when they apply for grants, uh, they, they, or their faculty activity report. A, a faculty have to file an activity report every single year. And so you can embed something on that, have the item there, and then it's easily pulled out. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. Um, I just want to I, I say thank you for the, the connections you're giving to Greater Minnesota because it, it is very valuable out there. And uh, in my five years on the board, I've, I've seen that. Um, concentrated effort to do more and more and more of that. And I think your talking points in the newspaper are good and your potential in the radio is good. Um, but the thing I think works the best, and I wish we'd do more, but I think the greatest asset the university has here is our people. 
and if we can get them out there, I know I worked with Provost Hansen one year to get the university's jazz band to go to different communities so they could teach kids during the day and give a free community concert that night. And I think those people interacting with, with other people is the best thing we can do. And, and when we talked about budgets yesterday, there was this aspirational budget. I, I asked the uh, Professor Sorensen, how come the jazz band doesn't do this more often? He said, well, we don't have any money. <laughs> and you know, um, I've talked to, to Miss McCann, the, the marching band, and she, she'd love to do stuff like that. She says, well, we just don't have the money. And the, the, the impact that they make in these communities um, is just incredible. So I just like to challenge my board when, when we, uh, my, my colleagues, when we look at the budget, let's try to find ways to get more aspirational on those type of things. Mm -hmm. I don't need a comment, but that's uh, a response. That's just a comment I have. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Regent Anderson. Um, uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, Three things. First, I'm really supportive of a strategic planning session in a St. Paul bar as long as the Iron Ranger. <laughs> um, secondly, I'm back to seriousness here. I really appreciate the focus on on what on the vernacular. It's easy to say outreach, research, and education, and there's far less, you know, un lack of clarity around what research entails and what education entails, but. Outreach is, and, and that's the, been the point of the last couple of days. So keep digging in that. Keep helping us understand. I, I like words like public engagement better than outreach. And uh, just just don't stop that work and keep informing. And I know the president will keep informing our strategic planning around that. But this is a mysterious third leg of this stool that's just tough to define. So thank you for that. And then um, um, with Vice President Kramer's shop. I really feel and see that there is progress here on two fronts. One, you're starting to zero in on the content so that it reflects engagement to me and across the messaging and then across delivery channels, delivery media, and the delivery technology. I'm really glad to see you experimenting and open and learning as to what works and what doesn't work. So content's getting really good and I think you're, uh, you're, you're working a lot of non-traditional angles across delivery. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent McMillan. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm just kind of following on that. Um, it, you know, this is, uh, I appreciate the presentation. Uh, I think that the engaging with the public, the way you've captured those categories, um, you know, you I mean, a person can maybe wiggle this way a little bit or that way, but I think overall I'm very, comfortable that you've done a nice job of, of, of capturing that and, and uh, you know the quantification part of it becomes you know always always is an issue but I, I will say you know again following off of Regent McMillan you know having having sat in in this seat in two very different eras uh, when it comes to communication I can tell you that we have made tremendous advances and you should be you should be congratulated um, you know I I think to a fault sometimes assume my experience is the same as every other person in the state, but, but from, from my standpoint, I see so much more and hear so much more about the university um, than, than in, in times past. I, admittedly, in the past five years, I've had a little stronger interest in what's going on than, than a period before that, but having the, the relationship, I've always paid attention to what I hear about the university and what's going on. And when it comes to the new ways of communicating, you can imagine that your predecessors in, in uh, 1990, it was mail. Right, it was mail, and maybe some, you know, some place stories, some earned media, whatever the case is. But now, with the new ways of communicating as a society, you're doing a great job. And I mean, obviously, we can't rest because what we do today is not going to be what we do 18 months from now. But continuing to find ways of getting the message out and making sure people understand, um, not not just sort of the bragging rights thing, but to actually make sure people have access to and 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 uh, take advantage of the engagement opportunities that we have. And so. I just um, want to say I think that it's gone in a great direction. I think this, as part of the strategic conversation, is going in the right way, and uh, appreciate your efforts. Thank you. I believe that uh, Regent Basin would like to make one quick follow-up. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I, this goes without saying, and I know you understand this, but um, your visuals, your data, your stories have got to also include the urban community. and where. I'm elected out of, and or Regent Mayron's elected out of, we have the poorest census tracts in the state by far. 
There's a lot of talk about Greater Minnesota, and I think that's good. But we have got to balance that with the people in our communities who who are in need of these services. And when you you know showed Park Rapids, that's where these conversations tend to go automatically. It's Greater Minnesota, and uh, so just a plug for our communities who are often forgotten in these outreach conversations. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Beeson, I couldn't agree more, and I, I didn't deliberately choose Park Rapids simply to emphasize Greater Minnesota, but embedded in this conversation was something that we're extraordinarily proud about in university relations. The public opinion survey, since we started doing it, always showed a difference of opinion in, of Minnesotans in Greater Minnesota and how they answered that question that I showed, and those in the metropolitan area. Consistently, people in the metropolitan area were, were more favorable and more connected to the university. In 2018, for the first time, we closed that gap to within the statistical margin of error. I very quickly um, zeroed in on the Twin Cities here. You can see that um, measles being what they may, there's quite a bit more opportunity in the Twin Cities in terms of what the university does. And in fact, one of the ways we solve the problem of researchers saying, look, I do a tremendous amount of engagement, but I don't, have, I don't keep a list of geographically where I went. We actually put one mapping centroid on the Twin Cities campus or on their building. And then when you link to it, it will demonstrate that they work across the state. But Regent Beeson couldn't agree more and we're emphasizing both channels. Well, Mr. Chair, Mr. Kramer, there's a lot more density in town here too. So having, it does impress me that we've got a lot more measles here uh, in, the, in the urban area because we've got a lot more people in a, per square mile. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I'd like to conclude uh, with a few of my own, um, a, a, a few of my comments. Um, thank you very much for, for the work and the, and the presentation. Just a couple thoughts for you. Um, I appreciate the focus on, on the, on the um, public relations and the narrative part of this. I think it might be, it might uh, be helpful to, to look, you know, have one focus on the activity. Uh, as, as defined by in-reach, town gown, and public good mission fulfillment. I mean, that's really where the work is done. And, the, and the, obviously communicating that work is important, but I, I get a little confused when, when the two are really, so, so I think there's an activity focus that we should maintain. Second thing is I do think it would be very helpful if we could find some simple metrics. One, you know, one is spending. And we heard, we heard yesterday, I, I found it very interesting, the number of our panelists yesterday who are supported by, into, you know, private, private philanthropy, foundation. I mean, it's, it's, so even, even I think for the board to know it's five, it's 10, it's 20 million and, you know, privately funded activity, I think that would be, uh, the, the money I think would be very, very useful. And then Provost Hansen, to, to your very, I thought, very, very important comment on, you know, how do we prioritize this? I think that is a cr critical part of creating strategy. I, um, my view is it'd be helpful to take a shot at, at classifying our, our activity. It, it we'll never get it right because as you've all said, and I think we have a deeper appreciation of this now, it's very fuzzy. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily fit perfectly in different boxes, but I still think if we, if we make an effort to classify our activity, and even over you know, yesterday and last night, what did we hear? We heard, uh, we heard agriculture, we heard healthcare, we heard other state re uh, resources, water, whatever. We heard rural health, we heard mental health. I mean, I, there's, there's probably eight or nine or 10 that would be good enough. You know, it would start to give us a feel for where, where in fact is our activity concentrated and how is it concentrated geographically and is it enough or is it not enough? So I would just urge you to keep working that dimension of this because I, I think it will help the board, you know, give us greater clarity about um, the, you know, the impact that we're having and where the opportunities might be. So those are, those are a few comments from me. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we really appreciate the work and, and the presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. So um, before we move on to our next item, um, I'm going to declare a five-minute break.
a lot of slides. I don't know. So, is it just this? Five minutes, never five minutes, okay. yeah. never. So the answer break. Five minutes, the please. Never. Are here. I'm just going to wait a few minutes here for the rest of our colleagues to return. They're not here yet, so we're still, still waiting. Here's Mary. <laughs> All right, so um, Welcome back, everybody. And we'll now return to um, our next item, which is the East Gateway Project. And I'd like to make just a few comments before I turn it over to uh, our uh, presenters this morning. Um, I'd like to thank the board for their commitment of time uh, and energy and thought uh, to this initiative. Over the last year, we've all participated in background sessions, including last November, uh, in advance of the full discussion at the December meeting. Uh, where we had a very robust discussion of this initiative. Since then, uh, UMF has worked to respond to your feedback, and they're here today with a detailed proposal covering the concept commitments, a detailed memorandum of agreement that covers key governance mechanisms, in addition to other aspects of the project, and a detailed agreement on how and under what circumstances land will be transferred in order to advance this project. You've all seen this material in your docket. UMF will now review this with us. We'll have a discussion. Our goal is to vote on the resolution related to the university's participation in the East Gateway uh, develop, redevelopment project. Joining, me for, uh, joining us for the discussion are UMF President Kathy Schmittelkoffer, UMF Council Jennifer Bishop, current UMF Board Chair Lynn Casey, and past UMF Board Chair Ross Levin. So I'd like to thank all of you uh, for being here today and President Schmittelkoffer over to you to kick us off. <clears throat> well, good morning. Welcome. We are excited to be here today. Chair Powell, President Gable, and members of the Board of Regents, I am going to have our illustrious board chair, Lynn Casey, start us off today. Thanks, Kathy. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for the time that we have spent together and some of you uh, uh, with us individually. Uh, I'm Lynn Casey. Uh, I do chair the the board of the uh, UMF, and I'm here today representing 45 trustees, a quarter of whom are appointed by the regents. So a special thanks right now to Regents Anderson and Beeson and McMillan for your current service on the board, as well as to Regent Rocha for your service on the audit committee. I'm joined today at this table by the foundation's immediate past chair, as mentioned, Ross Levin, president and CEO of UMF, Kathy Schmittelkoffer, UMF's Council, Jennifer Bishop from Lathrum GPM, and I'm pleased that so many trustees have joined us today in the audience uh, for this important milestone. Thanks, guys. So thank you for your time today to review the plans and the agreements to hopefully advance a vision on behalf of the university, the East Gateway Project. Over 50 years, the foundation and its trustees have been proud to support and celebrate the U's academic research and outreach missions. Our sole purpose, and in fact, the very legal status of the University of Minnesota Foundation rests on its commitment to serve exclusively for the benefit of the University of Minnesota. And that principle grounds uh, the work of the foundation, the work of its staff, and it's the North Star every day for our trustees. From time to time, the Foundation's expertise and advocacy has been called on unique ways to serve the university. The Foundation and the university have partnered on critical programs, such as the Greek Safe Housing Loan Effort, Glen Sheen Economic Impact Strategy, Real Estate Development at U of M Rochester, and more. And we believe that our partnership with the university has never been stronger. As you know, a gift from James Cargill 
generous as it was to the foundation in, 19, in uh, 2007, resulted in the formation of the foundation subsidiary, University of Minnesota Real Estate Advisors, also known as UMFRIA. And over the last decade, the university has crafted its vision for this eastern edge that we sit on. It began with the Twin Cities Campus Master Plan in 2009, which was further refined with its neighborhood strategy. And it was also followed up by specific development goals for the eastern edge of the Twin Cities Minneapolis campus in 2016. Throughout that journey, the foundation has listened, partnered, and leveraged your vision to support the university with extensive financial, strategic, and operational due diligence that's been undertaken. And as a result, and with the support of university leaders and our trustees, UMF was well positioned to quickly and nimbly acquire and safeguard property on the eastern edge of campus, preserving its potential for the right time to advance the university's larger aspirations. For the past decade, foundation trustees and leaders have had the pleasure of working with three presidents, regents past and present, and university leaders in finance, real estate, and legal to get to today's discussion of the East Gateway District project. So here we are. And in our time together, we would like to further delve into the vision and the plans for the project area and review and hopefully approve the major terms and agreements around our proposed concept plan while considering your, your gracious input over the last month or two. A new memorandum of agreement specific to this project and our future real estate exchange plans to fully realize a district-wide vision. The Foundation's Board of Trustees approved each of these elements earlier this week in a written vote by the full board. And I'm pleased to tell you that with over 90% of our eligible trustees voting, that passed unanimously. So this is a critical time on the journey. I really do thank you for your support. And we continue working together to move this forward. And I'll turn it over to Kathy. Thank you, Lynn. I'll Chair Powell, President Gable, members of the Board of Regents, I too share a deep gratitude for your partnership on what we know will be a once in a generation opportunity to transform the eastern edge of our Minneapolis campus. Today, we move from vision to action with a plan to help transform the east edge of campus, creating a world-class gateway fitting of this world-class university, and we are ready. Now, if we look at this picture, no doubt, each of us have crossed these intersections. We've walked these sidewalks. We've made our ways to meetings and lunches. Students have made their way to uh, classes and sporting events, and we do it all in service to the university. And likely, we had the chance to make similar walks on other campuses across the country. And I think we'd all agree we can do better than this. This doorstep is in need of a new identity. Better than this uninspired, single-story, fragmented commercial properties, surface parking lots, and no connectivity. Ever since the decision was made to bring football back to campus and expand our health services footprint, we knew that this intersection between students and community, patients and public realm, entrepreneurs and research talent demanded something better. We saw the challenge and we embraced this opportunity. And we see what happens when we leave the private sector to define its own strategies. Disconnected and uncoordinated development, buildings built right to the sidewalk, no green space. And we've seen the explosion of private sector student housing. We haven't kept pace with the demand for the differentiated uses, like office and incubator space and conference, a hotel and event spaces. We have random towers that pay little attention to the needs of the community and campus, but focus on maximizing their boundaries. And we know it's a desirable location, ideally situated between two cities, minutes from our airport and our Fortune 500 companies. Our economic development leaders tell us the number one thing we, they are asked by business owners is how can we get closer to the university? And not just geographically, but intellectually as well. They seek that engineered serendipity that Dean Toller talks about when we cope co-locate a variety of disciplines committed to tackling similar challenges. Yes, the private sector wants to be here, but with our help and aspirations, we can build something that's more than one plus one, more than incremental development, something connected to a larger aspiration for this campus. 
It's why more than a decade ago, the foundation and university leaders began working together on creating that entity and this re bringing this reality. As Lynn shared, it started with a gift from the Cargills um, that began this opportunity. It was collective expertise that helped build the plan and together with the university, we committed to doing more together. Today, we're talking about a project that is firmly grounded in the university's expectations and aspirations. And over the last seven years, we have been strategically acquiring available parcels within the boundary of this project. Already, we've been collaborating to understand the impacts of this vision on the infrastructure, whether it's the stormwater drainage or IT systems, parking or pedestrian safety, our hope is that it can be solved towards a larger district-wide solution. But let me be clear, the challenges are not the universities to solve. If we cannot engineer solutions that meet the district's need, the obligation to meet those parking and infrastructure needs will be the responsibility of the East Gateway Project and its partners. And enough confidence has been built and willing partners are at the table. In staying closely aligned with the university, we believe we are poised to go to the city of Minneapolis and start mapping the re and realizing those aspirations. And at the center of the conversation sits a concept plan that must excite and inspire the city, the neighborhood, the university community, and the private sector. That concept plan not only brings forth possibilities, but establishes key commitments and principles. You have seen the narrative concept plan as part of today's document materials, and I'll summarize it here. As owners of this building that houses our work and our staffs, I assure you, we share your commitment to a safe, welcoming, and vibrant place. We commit to achieve a diverse mix of interests on the ground floor and in the public realm. And like the university's plan for sustainability, we aspire to use this project as a model for sustainable development and create high design standards that others can emulate. The concept plan commits a mix of land uses to achieve goals for connecting with a spectrum of community and university stakeholders. It includes office, innovation, and research start startup spaces, residential space, much needed conference and hotel space, and most importantly to our mission focus, a vibrant first floor and public realm, ideally featuring restaurants, student businesses, retail, and entertainment. We share this aspirations for creating design, architectural and sustainability models that can be lessons for other districts and neighborhoods. We want the edges of our campus to be a destination where people not only come to have dinner, but cross campus and enjoy an exhibit, a show, or even a football game. Where a patient can find reprieve from their treatment protocol, and even an enterprising student can bump into their future business partner in line to grab some coffee. So this is where we begin. This is our collective footprint. We imagine a destination as equally connected to the river, as to the Scholar's Walk, as to the Washington Avenue Bridge. It is an epicenter of possible. Unique to this project and our promise to keep the university's reputation front and center, it is our commitment to forever own and control the first floor experience. As we identify important development partners, our focus will be to maximize the pedestrian experience and improve it for everyone who crosses these streets on their way to their meetings, to their lunches, to their classes, and to the sporting events. There is a once in a generation plan required, these once in a generation plans we do require the patience and deliberate phasing. Indeed, we expect the project will only be fully realized by the next generation of leaders. We begin with phase one, where we have the most opportunity to create an anchor for the rest of the project. We hope to capture that dead space at the eastern edge of the project area and start creating a public realm experience that leverages the open spaces, light, and design. And we are excited to get these conversations started with the city this spring. Phase two will come approximately five years later. Future phases will be built on subsequent decisions and respond to market forces, demand for living and workspaces, and the university's stated plans for optimizing residential and research intersections. Phase three will uh, coincide with the university's hopes for its clinical campus. The market will help us shape the project to extend our commitments to connected public realm toward the river and to the neighborhood. It's not until this phase or later that the current Dinnegan residential properties will be transformed as part of the project. And by the time today's brand new Minnesotans start choosing their future destination for college, we'll be looking towards the final phase of this project. 
and together we'll create a place that says welcome. Welcome to East Gateway. Welcome to the University of Minnesota. Our commitments reflect our shared vision and our legal status demands that our work be in service to this university. So that is our concept plan. I hope you are just as excited as we are. I'd now like to ask Ms. Bishop to review the other two key agreements, the memorandum of agreement, agreement and the real estate exchange agreements. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, Chair Powell, President Gable, and members of the Board of Regents. Um, as usual, the words start with the lawyer. The, everyone else gets the pretty picture. So um, <laughs> first, I really want to thank the Office of General Counsel, the university and board leadership, and all of you for your time over these past months. As we brought this opportunity forward and sought to create a new framework to work together to best position the East Gateway Project for success in the private development sector. To date, as Kathy mentioned, the foundation has acquired and administered real estate um, in the project area for the purpose of assembling sufficient land that together with the parcels the university owns would provide an opportunity to transform the area into the vision Kathy just outlined. As the project entered into the master planning stage, it became clear to both the foundation and the university that we needed to clearly define the role of each in the project, not just for now, but for the decades to come. Similar to the memorandum of understanding that the foundation and the university have related to the foundation's overall operation as a central development office for the University of Minnesota, we've worked with OGC and board leadership to develop the East Gateway Project Memorandum of Agreement that you're considering today. The memorandum of agreement is designed to create a structure under which the foundation will lead the East Gateway Project in partnership with the university and its appointees on the foundation special committee and working with the private sector to achieve the East Gateway Project vision consistent with the concept plan principles and commitments. We've identified three key principles which have guided the memorandum of agreement as well as the land exchange agreement that we'll talk about briefly. Um, those principles are promoting and ensuring collaboration between the university and the foundation at all levels, aligning responsibility with land ownership and financial risk, and setting ourselves up for success with the private sector as well as the city. There are, of course, a number of ways that the East Gateway project could be redeveloped. The memorandum of agreement and related documents outline the structure that the foundation with its advisors believes has the best chance of success with the private sector. That is the redevelopment being led by the foundation, real estate being owned by the foundation, managed under a governance structure, but always with university alignment and input into each key decision with regard to the redevelopment project. That alignment starts with the Board of Regents approval of the concept plan. You will note that since December, we have moved from aspiration statements to a list of principles and firm commitments. Of course, at this stage of the planning, the commitments are necessarily high level, but they do provide a structure within which the development will proceed. The foundation will then direct execution of the concept plan based on three principles. We share a commitment that the land in the East Gateway project will forever be owned by the foundation or the university itself. That we've formed a new special committee to ensure that key decisions are made by a skill-based group, including university appointees, designed to that ensure that decisions are aligned with university's interests. And we have agreed that this project will not create a competitive environment for the university, no higher education, no clinical care that will compete with the expanding clinical campus. Because the East Gateway project will span over two decades, we created structural ways to ensure that the university's ongoing alignment and create vehicles for the university's input. The role of the special committee, which we call the East Gateway Project Committee, is a new governance structure created as a vehicle through which the university's interests can be formally communicated. The special committee will approve the key development decisions, which are listed on the slide, and all members of that committee have fiduciary duties to the foundation and its mission, and the university appointees also have additional fiduciary duties to the university itself. Of course, while the foundation is not itself a public institution, it's organized and must be legally operated exclusively for the benefit of the University of Minnesota. So all of its actions, including the execution of the East Gateway project, must be in support of and to honor the mission and goals of the university. Further, the foundation as a nonprofit corporation is also obligated to not serve private interests. So while the foundation will be working with private developers to complete the East Gateway project, its business relationships with private interests must be on fair market value terms. That means no sweetheart deals, um, no party to insider transactions. 
Importantly, transactions which do or may include interested parties would be subject to approval by the special committee, including approval of the university appointees on that committee. And as Lynn started, we do know the close connection between the foundation and the university from a governance standpoint. The Board of Regents appoints a quarter of the foundation's board. We have the president, two regents sitting on the board, um, as well as on the executive committee. Finally, know that this is not a one and done communication with this body. Um, ongoing obligation to communicate back with the full board as well as leadership on an ongoing basis as to the status of the East Gateway project. The final piece of um, the relationship has been the real estate exchange agreement. We've been working with OGC on those terms to accomplish a phased approach for land transfers to occur as each party needs land. As we know, there are three parcels of land um, that the university owns within the East Gateway project area, and the foundation also owns three parcels of land that the university needs to expand its clinical campus. While we originally described these transactions as swap agreements, um, as our thinking evolved, we realized that we really are talking about a phased approach to land transactions when each of the party has need for that land. Um, there are significant contingencies on the land transfers that the university would need to approve, in particular the IT infrastructure and stormwater. Um, so know that, again, this is not a one and done. You will be back at this table to talk about the land transactions when we're ready to make those transactions. What we've done in the land exchange agreement is really create the process and the structure for that decision making going forward. Um, finally, on um, the infrastructure approvals, know that the, the university parking, as Kathy mentioned, will not be tapped or expected to support the project without express university approval. So again, this is not the last time you will be hearing from us on this project. We appreciate the input that we've received to date. Um, with those legal details out of the way, I will turn it back over to Russ. Thank you, Jennifer, Chair Powell, Thank President Gable, members of the Board of Regents. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, this morning, I want you to, before I get started, I want to tell you this morning started out rough for me. Um, I actually cut my nose shaving. I didn't even think that's possible, but I <laughs> cut my nose shaving. So I'm, I'm feeling a little bit vulnerable right now. So I just want uh, Regent Rocha to understand that as he <laughs> thinks about what's going to be going on. I'm very, very fragile right now, Regent. Um, <laughs> I want to thank our board chair, Lynn Casey, and Kathy Schmittelkoffer, and Jennifer Bishop, the Foundation's Council, for helping present the next steps in the Gateway Project, East Gateway Project. As I said when I spoke to you in December, I've had a four-decade love affair with this university uh, through the support of the state when I attended school here. Uh, I was able to put myself through school uh, because I was able to work, and the tuition was supported by the state. Uh, I was involved in things like freshman camp. I was an orientation leader where I met my wife. I was president of my fraternity, and I was president of the Interfraternity Council. So I've been very engaged in this university for a long time. I met my wife here. I met my future business partner here. And this university has meant a lot to me. In the ensuing decades, I volunteered, attended, responded, and served this university, as have so many of the Foundation's trustees. No one questions my love for my wife or the university. After today, my wife is just questioning the priority. <laughs> but, um, I cannot emphasize enough uh, how critically important it is that this project be aligned to the university's visions and plans. Uh, I also can't emphasize enough how much the foundation's trustees appreciate the trust that you have placed in us to serve the university's largest aspirations and and. Uh, like Regent Rocha said last time, uh, we, we are here to serve you. The Foundation's sole focus is to serve exclusively for the benefit of the university. We take that commitment with the utmost responsibility, diligence, and fiduciary commitment. So together with Lynn, we represent more than 40 trustees and literally hundreds of community leaders who have made a choice to be of service to the university because like me and Lynn, we care about Minnesota's university. So I'll turn this over to Lynn. Thank you, Ross, and I will close out. Um, so, Ross, um, first time I've ever heard you mention that you were fragile. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a totally different university story. Uh, I, I uh, moved here uh, as a grad student. I was a commuting student, uh, and I worked my way through by uh, 
working at the Minnesota Daily in offices that were right uh, where uh, the UMP offices are right now. And even back then, with no architectural or design sense at all, I looked out and I thought, I'm really glad I'm a commuter student because if I had to live on this campus, it would just about kill me. Even then I knew something bigger and more magical could be done. But in those days, in the late 70s, people really didn't care as much about place as they do right now, and it is a factor. I can tell you having kids who are recently doing you know, college comparisons, place is a factor. So we're here today to figure out how we can make this a great place. So as I close out, I just want to reiterate a couple of points. Um, we, we talked about our charitable status. We live and breathe. It's legal. It's reputation. Um, as, 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 as the university's reputation goes, ours goes, and vice versa. We do serve exclusively for the benefit of the U. So there's a lot of ways we could do this thing. And we've looked at every single one of them over the years. And we think this is the best way to proceed. Um, what we have is a shared plan. Lots of people have had their hands on it. We've got a shared commitment, and we've got a shared path for realizing uh, the vision. So it, this is unique. Um, it is a once-in-a-generation opportunity, and that's a responsibility that the trustees of the foundation take very seriously on behalf of the university that we do love. So we can build something great, and we can build something that generations after us are going to be proud of, and we can build it together with shared governance and oversight that a typical development involving the private sector uh, might find constraining. But we, we know that it's the right balance uh, because it will still be streamlined enough so that it works for the private developers that we think we want to attract to this project. So I, I again say thank you. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for the opportunity to continue to serve. We look forward to your questions and hopefully your support. All right. Well, thank you very, uh, thank you very much, presenters. To to kick us off, um, I'd uh, like um, uh, to see if there's a motion to approve uh, the resolution. So moved. So moved. Seconded. Okay. Moved and seconded. All right. Then um, let's let's turn it over to um, President Gable for her comments. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you, presenters. Uh, Thank you to everybody who's been involved in this project. The list is too long to even go point by point to thank. But as Lynn so aptly said, a lot of people have had their hands on this. And I think you all know who you are. And uh, you have my thanks and my thanks on behalf of the university to everybody who's brought us to this point so that we have the chance to consider this really wonderful opportunity. And it is, in fact, a wonderful opportunity. It's the sort of thing that can amplify everything that the university wants to do. We have spent the last two days talking about our strategic plan and our future and several of our initiatives as an institution, not the least of which is outreach and outreach in reach, if I can quote Regent Beeson, which can happen right next door. And while East Gateway is not core mission, it is exactly the sort of partnership or neighbor that the university would like to have as a bridge to all of the creativity that you hear us trying to harness and increase through strategic planning, through outreach and engagement, through research, through clinical care, through our amazing students and their creativity and their sense of entrepreneurship and the opportunities that we want to provide to them so that we can have a bridge to partners, to space, so that we can convene, so that we can be an attractor, so that we can incubate and so that we can be everything that we want to be in ways that we may not be able to steward directly ourselves. We're very grateful that a partner who is mission driven to benefit the university, in fact, is obligated voluntarily in service to the university wants to take this on. And that we are also grateful to the board who wants to govern this in a way so that the partnership can unfold in a way that everyone feels is ultimately in the best interest of everything we are trying to do together. So we're delighted to see this development grow. We're very optimistic about what this will mean across the board for how we can enhance what we do together for the benefit of the University of Minnesota and ultimately the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Gable. So I think everyone is going to be on the dance card here, but I will kick it off with uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, uh, thank you, presenters. I think I'd be remiss 
uh, without also thanking Sarah Harris, who um, who uh, brought great leadership, vision, and some bulldog with her on this project. Um, I've had the chance to be in economic development and urban projects for the last 40 years, both as a city planner and as a banker, and seen a lot of projects, public-private projects, projects up and down the avenue. And uh, I believe this is one of the great project opportunities I've ever seen. You know, real estate's always about location, and this is Maine and Maine. It really doesn't get any, it does not get any better. So, um, as we talked, you've talked some about what this is, what, but let's talk about what this isn't. This is not a site plan review. This is not a set of design controls yet. This is not, um, this is not a mitigation plan yet for, um, for the buildings that are on there. Um, those are items that are going to come later. This is a this is a framework. The factors that have influenced me to to like this project, and some of this will, will it's a reemphasis of what President Schmidlkoff made. But I it's got I I think we have to make the point. And number one, this is a project that will consist of uses that we don't have and that that the market has not brought to us because. It is impossible to assemble large sites sufficient for a developer to do what that which we're talking about doing. We now have the site almost assembled. Um, so that can't happen. Number two, we need a private sector with project management, relationships, development experience. We can't do this on our own. And we've got a great partner with the Polite companies. Number three, the university can't afford to have this project on its balance sheet and its debt. On the other hand, we have to have a partner like the foundation who um, uh, who can protect our brand. And in this regard, we've got a great partner. I'm going to remind people, this building was done with the resistance of the University of Minnesota. It was built because of leaders of the foundation, leaders of the Alumni Association, and now it's an iconic building. So anybody that doesn't think we can't trust this group to do what's right, their standards are so high, this building's a living example of that. Number four, we need to focus on the other side of the site, which is the land we're getting from the foundation and continually work on our academic health center. And I know the question has been raised, is there going to be enough land over there? I keep saying we're going to have to push south of Fulton. We're going to have to repurpose buildings uh, around the quad area. Uh, but that should be our focus and not being the developer of, uh, of the block we're talking about. Um, number five, we have to embrace this idea, and I was talking to Regent Rocha, I think I coined the phrase, this is becoming the third downtown, and that may be a shock. People may not like it, but this is great cities and great universities are getting big time density, and we had better embrace that reality. And it's not all bad. It's got to be really carefully planned, but we... We are a big city now, and this is going to be a big part. This is going to be the center of the metropolitan area in another 20, uh, 20 years. So at the end of the day, I, it, this project feels like it's got good balance, risk and reward, private sector, public sector, uh, flexibility and principles. I, I know it's just a start. I know there's a lot of questions, but I think this is the right structure and the right set of relationships to start this project with. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Regent Beeson. Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. I think that, uh, I mean, you know, I've had an awful lot of experience with this uh, project and lots of it challenging, but uh, ultimately, I'm struck by the fact that we need what this project and its vision will deliver. We need space for any innovation, and I think added to that word in light of our meetings this week would be engagement. And, uh, and, and I try to frame all of my thoughts around, around the vision for this. And I think Regent Beeson just brought the more practical side of an awful lot of that to life, but this will ultimately give us space for innovation and engagement that we don't have today. And I think the model for delivering the needed redevelopment that UMF has come up with here will bring two key factors, private sector capital 
and private sector development expertise that we don't possess inside this institution. We obviously can raise capital, but this isn't where we want to spend that. I think Regent Beeson just said that as well. Is the model that we've come up with here for governance and management of this perfect? No, it's not perfect. And uh, But I think we sacrifice excellence when we chase perfection. It's never good to chase perfection. And I think the question is not whether it's perfect or close to perfect or whether we could have done it differently. We're faced today, I think, with the question of will the governance structure in the associated management model that, that these agreements reflect give us, one, a pretty good chance at the outcome that we envision as reflected in that concept plan. And I think it will. We don't know that it's all going to go that way, but we've got a flushed out plan now that gives us a sense of where we want to be in 20 years, and I think that's consistent with what this university needs. Will it give us sufficient oversight to fulfill our fiduciary governance responsibilities? And I believe the special committee does that. Again, is it ideal? No, but I think it gets us what we have to have. And three, does it reflect our interest in mission-supporting infrastructure? And what do I mean by that? Parking, housing, IT, sewers, and ultimately the academic medicine facilities. And uh, I believe it does. I'm very focused, probably more focused than here than anywhere else, that the IT and uh, sewer and stormwater replacement things hold this university harmless, ultimately. And I believe these documents do that if we want to upgrade. That's on our nickel, but the project has to bear the cost of making sure this university doesn't walk away carrying any of the cost to keep what we have today. Housing is an interesting question, and I know there's, I'm sure we'll hear from lots of regents. I too worry about that, but I don't believe this development is the driver for the housing question. I believe the driver for the housing question is the decision we may make someday about a new hospital. And then, the housing questions become very real, and I believe it is incumbent on this board to make sure affordable on-campus housing for freshmen and hopefully a growing percentage of our sophomores, juniors, and maybe seniors can be accommodated in that. But the East Gateway development itself, unless we want to say we're going to take this entire chunk of land and set it aside and bank it until we're ready in 10 or 15 years to build new housing, this isn't the driver, it's the hospital decision ultimately that drives that, and we're not ready to make that today. So my last thought is that I don't think we can leave this to incrementalism and unplanned piecemeal development from the private sector. I think we need an orderly and a planned development to accomplish those goals that I just walked through. And I think that this plan gives us that opportunity, and I think that uh, it gives us a chance to meet the promising and incredibly consequential academic medicine future that lies out there, but on a different decision-making plan. So I, I plan to support this, and uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Regent uh, McMillan. Regent Anderson. Thank you, Regent Paul. Um, I don't think my comments would be very long, but I, but I uh, First of all, UMF exists to benefit the university. These are our friends. I look at that. Um, I also think that the acquisition and plan development of land around the university will benefit the university. Uh, in my opinion, while as Regent McMillan says, it's maybe not perfect, I think the foundation and senior leadership here at the university have worked very hard on the Eastgate agreements that give Regent Board members input on UMF decisions and some uh, latitude in how things are done. So those are kind of the facts I see. What really gets me, though, is the philosophical element. Um, when I was 19, I purchased a traditional business that had a history. And I never looked at myself as the owner of that business. I always looked at myself as kind of the shepherd or the conduit who had run this business in the right way until somebody bought it from me and became the new owner and protected that name. 
which is important to me because my name is on the business. And I think the philosophical here, the, the university, I've been here as a walk these, this campus since I was five years old. I walked it as a patient. I walked it as a student. Walked it as an alumni when I had to go to the Metrodome to watch football games. <laughs> and now I walk it as a board member. And I'm very grateful, although it's not perfect, of the people who made some of the decisions, for instance, that brought football back. Okay, we have TCF. So I sit here as a board member, much like I did running that business. I don't own this seat. I'm a shepherd till the next person sits in this seat. And I think today, with this project in front of me, the best decision I can make for that next person in this chair is to move forward with this project and give, give the leeway that we will have. So there's a fact-based decision in my time, but there's also a philosophical decision not to take the decisions away from the future board members. So, so with that said, that's kind of how I see it. Um, I will be supporting the project. Thank you, Regent Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, Regent Anderson. <laughs> Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, in response to Chair Levin, I would just, this morning I woke up and, and cut a quart of wood by hand and <laughs> <laughs> took a polar plunge in Lake Minnetonka and then ate a pound of bacon. So I'm feeling pretty robust. I'll, <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to hold back. I, I, you know, thank, thank you to the foundation. Uh, I mean, I, I, we've heard about this for a long time, and, you know, the challenge, the challenge with dynamics like this is, you know, we've had, for, for those that are foundation-related in particular, um, a very good recitation of the relationship between the parties. And, and, it, and, it, and it, it gets, you know, pretty personal, because it is personal, right? It's about personal relationships and about shared love for the university. And it's, it's hard to follow that. I mean, it's hard to follow that if you, if you say, yes, I'm on board, here are my concerns. It comes off as potentially disloyal or, or insulting, and that certainly isn't the intent. It's, when, when we walk into these conversations, it's, um, it's also, uh, it's still our job as a board, right? And, and sometimes, you know, that's, that's why it's hard to talk about things like compensation and, and positions because it's human beings and we have personal relationships. And in this situation, I, you know, I, I, I have concerns and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. I, I thank the foundation, I thank the Cargills for their commitment to students and student housing. And, you know, I, I believe you all received that, an email from me that talks about the importance of student housing, and Regent McMillan mentioned that a bit ago, um, that I don't have enough time to, to, to go into each of these kinds of concepts. But um, so, you know, ultimately, if we have differences of opinion, there are, there are questions about how this dynamic, how, how the two organizations work together. I don't have time to even get into the, the extent of that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get to yes. I'm trying to get to yes on not the concept, because you've had me on the concept of thoughtful development of this area of innovation space. Um, I, I've been on board the entire time. I, my, my issues really you know, evolve. The, they revolve, revolve around the issues of you know, ultimately what's there. Um, as I've stated to um, the chair, and I appreciate his copious time that he's offered to me in talking these things through is it's kind of a Hippocratic oath, you know, do no harm, right? Let's, what, what we do here, we, we need to be upside, and if there is going to be any sort of negative impact, it would have to be, you know, certainly outweighed by a, a positive uh, pursuit. Um, you know, and, and when I look, at, I look at our autonomy, and I think you'll, you'll have other members of the board speak to this here shortly, it's very important, and, and, and it avoids double regulation. Um, and thank you to the, the four of you for your time yesterday in, in a very lengthy dialogue uh, about some of these concerns. And, and again, we don't have two hours to you know, hash through the same topics. But, but you know, I, I liken the, 
the, the not using our autonomy in this situation where the university has this resource that anybody outside of the state who's involved in higher ed with whom I've interacted is like, boy, autonomy, that's extremely, extremely valuable. Surprising that you wouldn't seek to try to leverage that in a way. Um, you know, I liken it to having two parents living in different states. One is in Minnesota and one is in Missouri. And you choose to put your residence in Missouri and then attend the University of Minnesota in out-of-state tuition when you had the option of you know, making your residence in Minnesota and, and, and taking advantage of that. And I, I, you know, at this point, I haven't fully understood um, a basis to not seek to do that. I understand there's some confusion necessarily about how it would work. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a challenge. Now, this is an appealing concept, no question. Um, but again, my, my issue in, in, in the role of this board is to obviously, um, is, is to defend the university's interests protect the university's interest, not against the foundation, but, but against a development concept that other parties might see as beneficial, but we, in our estimation, have additional concerns about. Um, yeah, and, and going back to Regent Anderson just talked about, uh, about the athletic facilities, and, and boy, I could tell you the history of this Metrodome thing and, and, and how that all transpired, but um, we have billions of dollars in facilities now. Um, certainly market value, if not the cost of construction. Um, and we have a budget of well over $100 million. Probably won't be long before we hit $200 million for the athletics uh, budget. And I don't know that we've had a feedback from the athletics department as to how 3 million square feet of additional demand um, next to, next to uh, TCF and by our other facilities and the parking needs, um, how that will impact. Um, our capacity to succeed in that in that realm, um, and and I also haven't seen a um, any sort of study or report as to um, you know what our current parking demand is and our need is. I, I know that we don't have enough. I, I hear that all the time. Um, that our core mission, our faculty, staff, and students are frustrated. Our the people that are attending our sporting events are frustrated by our parking issue, and and so. Proceeding doesn't necessarily create the crisis. Proceeding in a way where this board is no longer in a position to exercise any sort of um, participation in the governance it does give me pause and, and, and makes me quite concerned. Um, the impact of potentially having 30-story buildings. Uh, there's the hub over here, and I, I hadn't really noticed it before this conversation. It's a big building. It, 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 that's, a, that's a tall building, and if you put 30-story buildings towering over our outdoor stadium, um, it, it turns the grounds into a shaded alleyway and it, it, you know, it has the impact of, of, of potentially impacting the field, potentially impacting the stands, um, you know, and, and certainly might, may have an impact on the Tribal Nations Plaza. These are very important outdoor facilities that we worked very hard to bring back to campus and invest in. Um, I understand there may have been a light study of some sort on IVAS you know, made the request to see it. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Um, but so degrading, parking, tailgating, and gathering space will negatively impact the experience, I believe. Um, and that's why I don't want to do that. That's why I don't want this project to do that. Um, and our ability to bring people to campus and the ability to make our athletics budget uh, that either pre prevents us from being able to contribute back to our general fund or requires general budget money to meet any shortcoming. That's, that's core mission stuff, and that's stuff that this board has to be aware of. Um, but what, another thing, and, and this, I'm, I'm going to present a, 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 a proposed, um, some proposed amendments, and I, Mr. Chair, I appreciate your indulgence here. I, I was trying to figure out, is it one at a time? I put them all in one. We'll kind of look at it in that way. And they're not intended to, um, to, to, to prevent the board from moving forward. They're just putting in protections that are consistent with what I believe you are saying. I, I very much appreciate you talking about this as not to, uh, to, to uh, have a negative impact on parking on campus. Um, and so my, my sense is if we're going to go the route that this board is no longer part of the approval process, that we would at least have an understanding that that, that is part of the process because that's inconsistent with the language as it's currently written. Um, but you know, this is I mean, as as it's written, and if and if everybody you know, I, there's a extra sheet that everybody received, and it includes paragraph 2.8b, which is addressed in the in the proposed amendment. Um, 
is that it talks about that the parties expect that existing university space, meaning something other than the three parcels that we are providing, will be included in designs analysis and governmental submissions for traffic, parking, energy, and public realm infrastructure. And so in, in essence, replacing the water runoff space, replacing the IT hub, likely replacing the firehouse, those things would all anticipate that the university is going to provide the space, facilities, infrastructure to cover those things. Um, that, that does not meet my do no harm concept. That actually starts to take space that is currently part of the university environment. And while I don't think, I would never say that we can't do it, um, I, don't think I, I, I don't think it's appropriate for us to have the presumption. Because by passing this, five years from now, 10 years from now, a future board is gonna look and say, well, look at here, it said the parties expect this, and, and, and whether this creates an expectation or even a commitment, I think is, is, is challenging, and that's why I don't think it's appropriate to be in the language. Um, so on the student housing issue, you know, I, I, sent, I, I believe, um, I hope you all, I sent you an email recently that, that included the report that we had received on this back in 2016 about the importance of student housing. It has incredible impacts on students. Um, two years of student housing, you know, while maybe it's not causal, at least I can't prove it is, it's certainly correlated with as much as a 25% or 23% increase in four year graduation rates for students that have that. That's why it is really essential that we understand this. And when I read that, when I read the MOA and the expectations here, um, I'm reading that um, that we are, there's an expectation that we're going to send a letter and the foundation would, would provide a letter um, related to uh, the continued need for student housing in a couple facilities. Now that doesn't prevent us from being able to have um, um, student housing replace it or otherwise, and this goes to Regent McMillan's, I think, apt comments that these are some decisions down the road. But I want to demark this time right now. I, I want to be on the record right now and saying that, that we have to be mindful of that because I'm not understanding that to be part of the fundamental uh, approach of this, of this plan. Um, again, I, you know, I've been trying to find a way of ensuring the Board of Regents isn't minimized to being inconsequential in this process. Um, when we talk about you know, one of the, one of the, uh, the items in here, um, the slide that was up about the memorandum of agreement principles, it, it says governing principles promote collaborative governing roles within the, with the university and then align governing body responsibility with land ownership. Well, the challenge with the juxtaposition of those two bullets is we're being asked to give up all land ownership. So if our governing responsibility is aligned with our land ownership, we have none. And I, I, you know, again, unless we have very specific commitments and requirements that this, that the proposal, when it's finally, when we finally get past the high level uh, concepts as was described earlier, that those would ensure that we're not going to create some, you know, serious difficulties because you can imagine a number of years down the road and millions of dollars in investment in this project, um, there's gonna be a tremendous amount of pressure on the people, whether it's the, the special committee or whether it's the foundation board to move forward, even though there may be some things that that come forward that wouldn't be in our, our um, clear uh, expectation or interest. I think we should take it, you know, we should seek to take advantage of the university's autonomy, but that is left for another day. If we find that in order to make this thing not only beneficial for the university, but economically viable, that may be something that I would hope continues to be an option as part of the conversation. I appreciate that dialogue last night. Um, and you know, and however this moves forward, I, I would want to, you know, I would ex hope that we could rely on the expertise and commitment of the foundation, even if, you know, contrary to the, the response that we received to a question, even if the university has some ownership and or governance stake, um, because we're all still, certain, you know, I would, I would hope the commitments to the project, not to the commitment to control. Um, anyway. Um, So this isn't a question of, of whether, whether I trust or anybody else trusts the foundation. We do, but that doesn't obviate our obligation as members of the board. I'm, I'm more concerned about the fact that this is not, it's not just the foundation that's gonna be running this. It's gonna be private, contract, private developers with a for-profit motive. Um, and under, just understanding the dynamics, I just want to ensure that what ultimately comes forward is something that is that is going to serve the university, and this is, these are decisions that will you know likely be made after I'm no longer on the board, 
Um, and, and, and for that sake, you know, some of these decisions will be when none of us are on the board. I would disagree with, uh, with the foundation folks that this is a generational decision. I think this is a century decision. This is a hundred year decision and, and certainly with billions of dollars at stake. So this is a big deal. So at any rate, um, Mr. Chair, I, was it was the draft handed yes, out? Yes, the, the Rocha amendment has been distributed. Um, every member of the board has a copy. The uh, representatives from the foundation, it's publicly available. So it's, I think we've all, we all have it. And, and, and again, so I- So you're offering, this is being presented as yeah, an amendment. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I, I've obviously worked off most of that pound of bacon, but um, <laughs> If uh, I would move it, if I can just speak to the language just briefly, then briefly, yes, um, I, I would move. I would briefly, move. We need to I would move the amendment. All right. Is there a second? Second. Okay. The Rocha amendment has been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion, Mr. Chair? Just just to just to talk about this to, to go through it quickly. Um, and, and this uh, off of the not seeking excellence at the exclusion of, or not seeking perfection at the exclusion of excellence. I don't, I don't know that we've achieved excellence in, in this language, but trying to get to these points. First, I, you know, I, I find it, I, 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 I'm uncomfortable that the foundation's perspective is that the, um, the board may only appoint representatives on the special committee if approved by the foundation, subject to the foundation's um, expulsion at any time without cause, um, which is effective immediately. I think that if we are collaborative and working together, and if you trust us as much as my colleagues and I trust you, um, the board would be putting people on the, on the, the committee um, it, it, with, with the right intent and with the right capacity. Um, I, I, I don't think that I, I don't find it appropriate that we should be told we can't have a, someone that is an officer, um, official, or employee of the university. I think that we should meet this with a greater level of respect, and that we would be entitled to appoint um, anyone that we would select, and that these people would serve at the pleasure of the university. Um, the second bullet goes to the fact that when there are significant components of the of the plan that are before the committee, if one of our representatives is concerned enough to the fact that it would have a negative impact on the institution, I believe that that's something that would warrant the board then being asked um, to resolve, meaning that the, the foundation, if, if unable to achieve all three votes from the university appointed members, or the region appointed members, may appeal to the Board of Regents to resolve the question. Um, next is that, you know, I, I, as, a, as a public official in a, in a body that works very hard on transparency and accountability, um, this, this agreement already contemplates interested transactions. Um, you know, I, I understand this may be quite common in the private sector of this sort. Um, uh, I, I do think that to ensure that what's being pushed forward through the experts on this would be pushed through with, by people that don't have a personal financial interest that could potentially push up against their willingness to um, do what's in the best interest of the, of the foundation's efforts to support the university. Uh, the, um, the project itself, and this is consistent with the language that was just presented by the foundation, is, is expected to provide, uh, will, will provide sufficient parking in the project area to meet the increased demand created by the project. Does this mean that you can't come back to the university with a deal that's too good to refuse and, and you know, demonstrating that it's absolutely necessary that we look at giving up parking that we already have in some way? No, it doesn't prevent that. Paragraph 2.8b is, it, this says it's deleted, but you know, really it, it, it's, it's the second paragraph um, that, uh, that I'm concerned about. Obviously coordinating, absolutely, we should be working together on this to make sure it makes sense for everybody. But it's the part that says that there is a presumption, there is an expectation, perhaps even a commitment that we are gonna turn over land and parking to support this privately developed project. I, I, don't, I don't think that that would be appropriate unless the university board would retain the ability to make those final approvals. By, by ex removing that language, the foundation still may bring that request to the university, but it would ultimately have to come through the Board of Regents to make that, that alteration. Uh, and then again, there's, that, there's no presumption that these things will be um, uh, on university <laughs> property. In fact, that, that bullet's not necessary if the bullet before it is in there. And then also, um, we've talked about height, height issues. And again, in the absence of having seen 
anything that talks about how this is going to impact our current facilities and very, very important facilities, I would like there to be a provision. This, this is a very imperfect way of saying anything that's going to have an impact needs to be brought back for our approval on a concept plan. Um, it, you know, again, uh, because the idea that, at this point, I can tell you from this, this position on this board, if we were to be putting 30, you know, a series of 30 story buildings right across what has been something we fought very hard to bring back to campus, I think that would be a degradation in what we have here and that would be a problem. Um, and so that, that's the point of that bullet. That's it, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. So the Rocha Amendment has been uh, moved and seconded. I'd like to get comment and discussion now. And I think maybe I'll just ask the, uh, found if the foundation would like to uh, respond or, or uh, elaborate or, uh, in any, on any of the elements of the amendment. Um, thank you, Regent Rocha. I don't really mean that. No, but no, thank you. Um, I think that uh, I appreciate I appreciate your comments. In fact, some of the things that that uh, you are describing uh, make sense to us, and I think all of them make sense to you. And I understand that. There's a few different things that I want to say. The first thing I want to say is that um, you talk about a, a commitment to the project, uh, not a commitment to control. And I just want to say from, from our end, what we're committed to is a successful project. And there are many ways that this project can be done. And over the last several months, using all our experts uh, working with the administration, we think that the, what we're proposing gives us the best chance of success. It doesn't mean it's the only ch chance of success. So we're not asking for control for control's sake. We're asking for control because the feedback and the research that we got uh, indicates that this is the best best way of doing it. And again, it's not control, it's we, we view this as collaborative. You put together uh, several different amendments. Um, I would prefer myself if we if the amendments were broken down uh, significant uh, independently. And the reason I say that, you know, we've worked over the last six months uh, diligently to achieve alignment uh, and ensure the success of this project. Um, What's in front of you today has the support of the foundation. We know that the foundation's board of trustees supports this. Neither Lynn or, nor I are empowered to uh, change these documents, and we don't believe that the material changes that you're proposing are going to uh, improve the success of the project. I mean, it would be very hard for us to go back and say, um, we support these changes. I individually, as a whole, uh, I don't, speak for the foundation, but I would not support all these changes the way you've proposed them, and I would have some influence over that. But, but there are many ways to approach this project, and I think some of these uh, have merits and, some, and they all have challenges. Um, we believe the, the agreements in front of you today provide assurance to the trustees that we can operate this project and operationalize it because agreeing to go forward is a huge step for you and it's a huge step for us, but it's a really tiny first step because we have to somehow figure out how to integrate this, run this, manage this, and take responsibility for it. So um, I, I would consider many of these things that you put in here, material changes, that um, I would hope the regents would vote no on. If we take a couple of these individually, if we break them down individually, I think that we could view a couple of these changes as things that we could agree to because it weren't it wasn't things that we intended in the first place so i don't know how to change the amendment but i but i can speak that a couple of these things i think that we could go forward with without needing approval yeah let, let me just add that i um there are two the uh bullet number th bullet number three uh it was certainly not our intent it was our intent to have the east uh that that, that committee the special committee be be pure. So that's one uh, that I think we could clarify in language as well as the, um, as well as clarifying some of the language around parking because it's not our intent to go at this and ask the university to foot the bill on parking at all. So it, it is a shared division wide uh, look at parking because that's what we really need. The others, We've studied this, we've asked every single question 
that comes to these bullet points. We've turned it around uh, with OGC, with university leadership, with real estate people, uh, with our own uh, private sector uh, advisors um, over the past couple of years, plus, plus, plus. And the rest of those uh, are, 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 they just won't work if we want to keep the private sector involved in this project. Uh, it's too much process. They will run. And we won't get the people that we really think we uh, deserve on behalf of this university. And um, we, we just can't. It's, uh, but as Ross said, there are many, many ways to, to, to develop and redevelop property. Our path, we think, is going to get us to the best vision. And some of these bullet points we just, just won't fly. Thank you. Okay, there are a number of regions who want to, uh, uh, who also want to comment. So we'll start with Regent Swiggum. Could I just ask? I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Chair Powell, but could I ask a point of clarification? It's not a comment on it. It's more for clarification for our discussion going forward. So, you can, sure. Mr. Swig if uh, Regent Swiggum would yield to me just for that, I'd be glad to. All right. I, it, the bullets aren't numbered here, so I want to make sure that I understand when you say, it, it sounds like you've identified a couple of bullet points, maybe two or three, that is something that wasn't intended or could be worked with and the others would m represent material changes and you right. couldn't agree. It would just help me to know which ones fall within the uh, two or three that uh, could be worked on or could be accommodated and which are the ones that are deal breakers. Sure. Thank you, and thank you for allowing that point of clarification. Sure, I, I can address that. We thank you. Around. Sure. Um, so we have indicated, so the third bullet that talks about that no associate is defined in the memorandum of agreement would sit on the special committee. That That's language intended, I believe, to say that we would not put an interested party as a member of the special committee, and that was not our intent. We, we do not intend to put an interested party on the special committee. So I think that's a point of clarification that we certainly can make. Um, on the parking, I think we can also clarify. Well, which I'm bullet sorry? is that then? The, the next park. one is number four. Okay. If there were numbers instead of bullets, it would be number four. Um, the bullet indicates that the project must provide parking. I would probably flip that. It's not the intent of the project to obligate the university to provide parking. Um, that's certainly something we can also clarify because we've certainly said that was the intent. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, Regent Swiggum. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and I think, Mr. Chairman, we're still dealing with the entire OSHA amendment at this point. It hasn't yes. been divided or anything at this point anyway. Um, <clears throat> members um, and, and Regent Rocha, I, I totally appreciate your, your passion to this, your protection of the university and the issues that you brought forward um, as a package. But members, I, I have to tell you, over the past years, our chair, our former chair and our former former chair uh, with the UMF with with Kathy and Jennifer and Ross and Lynn and uh, obviously us using Mr. Peterson uh, who's performed wonderfully by the way Doug you have you have taken ideas that Ken has given you or thoughts ideas he's given you and put them into words and uh, words at work and I'm, I'm amazed that you can do that at times but members, any good negotiation in good faith, there's always a little give and take. Um, there's always a negotiation that takes place. You end up with an agreement, a compromise. It doesn't mean you agree totally, but it does mean you cooperate. That, that's, what, that's what a negotiation is. That's what a compromise is. You end up to a, to a point of cooperation, that it can work, that you, you bring people together. And I, I think the three individuals representing the board there in their former capacities and their current capacities have done it in a very, very good faith matter. With the, the, there's been some times, Kathy, it's been a little, well, the words. It's, in the, it's been but, appropriate tension <laughs> to get to the best problem. Yeah, well, Rep, Mr. Levin right there, uh, Rick, you and I remember meeting him a week ago or two at the basketball game and coming up and He's, Ross looked at me and said, it ain't going to work. And I said, what do you mean it ain't going to work? <laughs> Ross, you uh, surprised me that day when you said that. But uh, 
but you made it work. What I'm trying to say is, folks, negotiations is a give and take. I think we brought forward an agreement right now that protects the university, forwards our mission, uh, that protects our reputation, our reputational risk. Uh, we're all in this together. Right. Um, I was going to tell you, Mr. Chairman, as a politician, sometimes politicians like to take credit for things that they have very, very little to do with. And they don't like to take the blame for the things they really made decisions on. Uh, 20 years from now, folks, I want to drive by here with my grandkids, good Lord willing to drive by here with my grandkids and say, you know, I was part of that. Uh, a small part, really, really small part. I'm going to take credit for something I had nothing to do with. Um, but we've come to this delicate point in the negotiations, folks, where, where I think that we should not become more restrictive so the project, project will not become a success. I think we put in the guardrails to protect our fiduciary responsibility as a board, to protect our reputation as a board, um, and I thank UMF for for working with us so that we could do those things and bring forward to you as board members a resolution uh, that, that I think will make it work in the best interest of our university and our state. And, uh, needing to speak about the entire amendment now because that's what we're on, and without speaking about specifics, I, I would hope that we would uh, defeat the Rocha Amendment and, and move forward with the uh, the good faith negotiations that has taken place. Thank you, Regent uh, Swigum. Uh, Regent Mayron. Uh, I, too, would uh, oppose this amendment as it's worded. Um, it with I count up, I think, seven modifications that Regent Rocha has put forth. Um, and if it we're going to vote on the totality, then I would vote against the amendment. I will be voting in favor of the project, but I think I'll hold off on those comments now. Uh, with that said, uh, voting against the amendment, I am hearing that there are a couple items that could be, they're not material apparently to the uh, foundation, they, the language that's in um, the memorandum of understanding it sounds like they're willing to clarify to make sure that a couple of the provisions accurately reflect what was intended. And I, I prepared if later, if it's appropriate, to make a motion that will give, I think, the chair of the board, the chair of the foundation, the authority to, to um, address non-material clarifications to clean up the uh, agreement. And I would think these provisions would fall within it. I've already uh, brought forth uh, a few, I think there's three little wordsmithing things that already have been discussed with the foundation that they too would be willing to do because it clarifies the original intent between the university and the, and the uh, foundation. So, uh, for now, I would oppose uh, this amendment. And the, the big picture reason is because I think it materially changes, these amendments materially change the project, and I think ultimately uh, would prevent this from going forward, and I very much want to see this project uh, go forward. Oh, apparently I'm, okay, they can't hear me. Somebody can. <laughs> I'm not saying it again. <laughs> I very much want this project to go forward, uh, and the big picture is I can't think of a project that is more consistent with one of the three pillars of our mission, which is outreach and inreach, um, which we heard a, a, a wonderful presentation about before this. I think this project fits right within it. Is it perfect? The agreement? No. But is it within the realm of reason? Absolutely. And I'm very excited uh, about what what the foundation and the university have the opportunity to do together. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Regent uh, Mayron. Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you, presenters. <clears throat> um, I, I too am very uh, favorable of this project and I really appreciate you bringing it forward. I think it's uh, definitely gonna be an asset for the, uh, for the university. 
My concerns uh, go to some some of the stuff that's already been said, lack of oversight by the Board of Regents. I think some of these amendments address that. And so one of my concerns, Chair, is that we're having to make decisions right now without having time to evaluate this thing in a bigger picture. Or we have to vote on the amendment, on the uh, proposal as it's presented to us. And then we've had these amendments. They've already said they, they some of the amendments are acceptable. So we're, so that's one of my concerns. So the other concern, so governance and management, board of role, uh, regents uh, role, and the decisions that we're making now, how it's going to impact regents in years to come. By the time this project's done, I'm going to be dead. And, and uh, you know, but there's other people that we're making decisions for now, taking away some of their, their stuff. I'm also, as I was going to talk more about this than I won't, I'll just brief it, uh, just to abbreviate I'm, uh, a couple of things. Some of the language in the original proposal bothers me. The one about, uh, uh, you know, that uh, the Board of Region Control, I want a partner, I don't want to control necessarily, but have voting rights, uh, impinges on the success of the project. How does that opinion, where did that come from? Uh, uh, some other ones too, uh, uh, double regulation, where did that come from? Uh, uh, um, uh, some of the other language that bothers me is we insist on this land swap. That doesn't sound well with me. What's that mean? Doesn't sound like uh, you know uh, good language for an agreement and working together to me. So uh, those are my concerns. I would like time to be able to think about this because I think some of these amendments address some of my concerns. And then the uh, the last point that I will make is and this may go to general counsel, as I look at some of the uh, Board of Regents policy, I wonder if we're violating them by voting on this. I'm looking particularly at uh, Section 8, uh, Subdivision 5, which basically says the board reserves the board reserves to itself authority to approve campus master plans and amendments thereto. And now we're giving that up. Which ones? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Regent Simonson. Um, Regent Kenyana. I don't have the Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> on the Rocha Amendment, um, I'll be brief, but let me frame up my thoughts this way before I ask a question. I initially was thinking of this project and, you know, previously the conversation was about control and admittedly that's where I was, th that's how I was thinking about it. But as I thought through that, I realized with controls, one comes risk um, in many different ways, uh, affects our balance sheet and, and things that have already been mentioned. Um, and then ultimately I think what kind of twisted my thinking or shifted it was thinking about mission. Every hour, every meeting that the president would be spending on this would be an hour not spent on the strategic plan. Every meeting that Vice President Bertelson would be engaged on this would be time not spent on mission. Um, so I switched from thinking about control to thinking about controls. Um, and, and, you know, the ones articulated in this MOU. Um, this iteration is personally for me much better. Um, and and um, I, I spoke with the chair previously about this, but I, I do I do want to ask one question, or just to at least receive a justification on, on one of the things brought up in the Rocha Amendment, and that's the first bullet point um, about the, the, the regent appointments, and not necessarily a response to the Rocha Amendment, but a comment on the original language in the MOU that either party may request the removal of a regent appointed member by providing notice to the other party with such removal. Um, so I just want to understand why this board shouldn't be able to explicitly um, decide who the, the board is submitting. Would one of you like to take Yeah. Thanks. I messed up last time. Thank you, Regent Powell. Regent Kenyana. Is that better? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, for a couple different things I just want to mention, and I, and I appreciate what Regent Simonson had said about uh, Delaying, and I, I just want to be clear on the um, on the Rocha amendment. The two bullet points that we said that would be we could work with um, would not mean a delay in the project. So if the project is that, those would be as as Regent Mayron mentioned, uh, non-material 
things that we can agree to. If the project gets delayed from this meeting, then I think that's, if the amendment continues or if the amendment is approved, then I think the project from, from our end would, would, be, would have to be put on hold because this has been going on um, for too long. We have more financial commitments that we need to make and so we would just have to do something else. But uh, Regent Kanyanya, what you were describing, I think, and I, and, and I know it sounds like it's a, um, a very weird thing to put in. Um, well, the way this uh, special committee has been set up, and again, this is from our governance standpoint, um, the special committee uh, is not an ad hoc, hoc committee of the foundation, it's a subcommittee of the foundation. So as a result, it's following the same procedures that the foundation has for all its committees, including, if you think about it, the regions that serve on the foundation uh, committee are approved by the foundation, uh, it's, you know, we haven't rejected a regent that, that has been suggested, but that's just, that's just to conform to the bylaws that we have of, of the foundation itself. So I know it seems like an odd thing, but that's, that's how this was structured. Um, and any other points? No, I, yeah, I would just concur that because it is a um, committee of the foundation's board, the bylaw provisions which empower the foundation's board and leadership to appoint board members, committee members, and remove them apply equally to this committee. So it wasn't intended to um, single out this committee from that perspective, but it's consistent with how the bylaws apply to all of the committees. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, as long as we're sharing how we woke up this morning, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, central time on the East Coast. Flew here as fast as I could. Uh, the pilot actually did a great job making time, uh, and I got here for this discussion, which I think is very important. Um, just to um, reply to Regent Swigum, you can take your grandkids and you can drive around here all you want. You just won't be able to park. <laughs> <laughs> and parking is one of my biggest concerns, having lived in congested cities like Chicago, New York, and London. And I don't really like the idea of the, the plans that I've seen here because um, I, I recognize that the city of Minneapolis is not really going to, or likely going to approve parking uh, for any of the projects um, that are developed here. And that's why the university's autonomy is so important because we can build parking wherever we want and there's less and less space to build parking these days. Also, I'm not sure how many hotel developers are actually gonna wanna build a big hotel or convention center without parking. Those are basic things that you know, until we start flying around with jetpacks and, and things like that, and people are still going to need cars and they're not going to want to rely on light rail um, and park uh, at wherever, you know, park it uh, on the either end of University Avenue, um, on the other end of University Avenue and take the light rail over to the university or park at the state fairgrounds to, uh, to, uh, take some shuttle to the university. So I, I have a problem with some of this. I feel like this has all kind of been rushed a little bit, uh, especially since we're debating some of the intentions of uh, some of the language in the MOA, which we only received, um, I think, less than a week ago or a week ago. And um, so I, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about the process that uh, this has taken. Um, the um, the uh, memorandums from our general counsel. I mean, I haven't been uh, a direct participant in any of these meetings, so I don't really know what's gone on, but I have read the mem memos. And I can tell that there is, there is perhaps too much tension um, uh, uh, related to this project. And the fact that, uh, you know, you guys are here asking for an approval today um, and threatening us with the fact that this project will have to be put on hold if we don't approve it today. I find that very troubling. Um, so I have a lot of other things I want to say, but I know we're talking about the amendment here, and I think the amendment um, does help me get um, 
more comfortable with um, where we're headed with this. Again, I, I'm not opposed to a project. I'm opposed to what I've heard about this project. I also believe that um, you know there's a lot of risk involved with the stormwater and IT functions. You know, perhaps a forty million dollar extra cost in relocating our fiber hub, which is in the IT building or under the IT building. Um, those are really significant issues that um, need to be, I think, handled a little bit more um, in a little bit more detailed way than has been um, to date. There are um, there are also a lot of things that I think could could be done. Uh, but I think the university is in a better position to actually own the land um, and use the autonomy to, to make this project happen. So um, I guess with that, Mr. Chair, I would request a roll call vote. Thank you, uh, Regent Chu. Before we do that, uh, uh, Regent Rocha, it's, this is your amendment. Uh, there's been a very good discussion. Maybe you could kind of bring it, bring it, your final thoughts for yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that, and, and, and I appreciate the points. Um, I note that I have much to learn from my colleague, Judge Mayron. If I had talked about these as clarifying amendments, maybe I went to had to <laughs> bring it. I think bring, someone would have noticed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're the shot, uh, but I just want to point out that these these amendments do not prevent this from going forward. Um, they just they just add a bit more control. I I I'm a little bit concerned about the thought that this is con that the committee issue the the the, the representatives are subject to, well, I, certainly the foundation has the ability to replace people on its own committees if the university is not involved, but this is not the foundation's people, this is the university's people. So it wouldn't be in your bylaws to have the university dictating when foundation committee members are knocked off com foundation committees. This, that, this is a unique committee. So I, 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 I you know, because we have, as you know, we have regents on there, we have the president on, on, on the foundation board, and I don't think they're subject to, um, uh, sort of one-sided uh, um, expulsion. All that aside, this, this this is not intended to stop this from going forward. This is intended to get to a level where I feel, as a member of this board, strongly that we will have a voice on matters that I think can have a very significant impact. Um, and, and also that it creates protections in the areas that I think are the most likely to be uh, potentially damaging. Again, I, I understand the urbanization, the, the, the downtown concept and so on and so forth. I've never been on a college campus and thought this would be so much nicer if it had taller buildings. I mean, it's, it's a little bit contrary to that general concept. But um, in any case, if we're going to move down that road and it's going to have an impact, I would like this board to be partners in having a say about whether that is the appropriate way for this to move. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Regent Rocha. And so with that, we will now clarify your pardon. Yes, Regent Kenyon. Thanks for indulging me. Just, would bullet one, could it be viewed as a friendly amendment or immaterial or whatever we're calling it? No. Uh, no, it cannot uh, via our bylaws. And also, um, Optically, in terms of everything that we have heard over the past several years from private development uh, and, and lenders, et cetera, uh, the, the optics around uh, regent and university control are very strong. And so we built the special committee with a lot of help from some of you and OGC to uh, make sure that there is you know, sufficient oversight and governance, um, more than the private sector would like, uh, without um, without having undue process. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're, I'm going to call for the vote now. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. Reed, Mr. Steves, if you'll take us through the roll call. Mm -hmm. and, and the vote is on the Rocha Amendment. Are you in favor of it or are you opposed? On the Rocha Amendment. Regent Anderson. No. Regent Anderson votes no. Regent Beeson. No. Regent Beeson votes no. Regent Davenport. No. Regent Davenport votes no. Regent Herr is absent. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. No. Regent Kenyanya votes no. Regent Mayron. No. Regent Mayron votes no. Regent McMillan. No. Regent McMillan votes no. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. No. Regent Swigum votes no. Chair Powell. No. Chair Powell votes no. <clears throat> 
So um, there are one, two, three, four, there are eight no votes and three yes votes. So the Russia amendment um, uh, does not pass. So let's move now to the uh, to the uh, the motion that was first put before the board, which is to approve uh, the uh, resolutions in your in your board. Uh, a number of you have spoken, and maybe you can help me out. Janie, uh, would you like to uh, speak uh, now? I'd like to speak in favor. I have a um, motion, uh, and um, Mr. Steves, will you be handling out a copy of it, a red line? So this is a motion to amend the resolution. Um, and I think what I'll do is wait until it's handed out so you have it in front of you. But I will, my explanation is to, uh, this would give the uh, board chair in conjunction with the uh, board chair from the uh, foundation, the ability or the authority to make non-material changes to uh, such, to the um, uh, memorandum of agreement. Uh, and included within them would be, for example, the couple bullet points that were identified um, in, in Regent uh, Rocha's motion for amendment that the foundation is indicated could be clarified and to uh, accurately state the intent of the parties. The uh, others were the, uh, I brought, I think, three different uh, scrivenering, um, wordsmithing uh, amendments to the uh, memorandum of agreement to the attention of both uh, the foundation and through our general counsel. And I understand there's been discussion and agreement on those changes already that are non-material. So, my um, motion to amend the resolution would be to add the language that is shown in the red line version at the uh, bottom of page one, be it further resolved that the board hereby approves the transactions described in the memorandum of agreement and the real estate exchange agreement and hereby delegates authority to make non-material changes to such agreements to the chair of the board working, uh, I, I think it should say in conjunction, uh, with the chair of the foundation board of trustees and respective council. So that is my uh, amendment to the resolution. I would make that motion. Okay, everyone's been that, heard uh, Regent Mayron's uh, motion. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Regent Swigum. I might need some help from uh, uh, Mr. Steves, the executive director and the parliamentarian. Um, uh, Janie, I'm not opposed to your effort in trying to bring some resolution to some non-material decisions. But empowering people other than this board that are voting to make some decisions, as small as they might be, my thought would be it would have to come back to the board again for approval. Um, that would be my thought. That it, we would empower them to make decisions. It would have to come back here for approval. And then, as Mr. Levin referred to, we're back in, we're stretching it out into March, and we're stretching it out even further. I, I might be wrong. Maybe we can empower a group to make a decision without, uh, without our final approval, but I would be very nervous over that. And I, it's not to say I don't support everything you're trying to do. I, I don't know what the insignificant changes are, but Mr. Steves, would you? Comments? Ma Mr. Chair, Regent Swigum, uh, the board has in current policy permitted the board chair, for instance, to make minor technical corrections to board policy. Um, and there are other instances such as that where there are, there's an ability to make non-material or, um, you know, small edits to things, documents and, and items of policy. So uh, it wouldn't be unprecedented to do something like this, but certainly it's, it's the prerogative of the, of the board. So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Steves, you're telling me we can empower our chair to make this decision uh, with UMF, I assume, and with our council uh, without bringing the language changes or the word changes back here for approval. Mr. Chair, Regent so this board can certainly empower um, its chair to do that on its behalf, of course. Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to ask Regent Mayron to withdraw the motion. I think uh, we should vote this up or down as it's been worked on for months. 
agreements can always be amended down the line. I expect this will be this will be amended at some point, <clears throat> several times. I mean, that's the way agreements are. But we should live with what we have. It's a good agreement, um, and uh, I agree with Regents Figum that um, um, there's a fine line between material and non-material, and the chair shouldn't have the ability to approve material changes and. Uh, um, Non-material ones don't really need to be amended. So I, I would ask Regent Mayron to withdraw our motion and let's vote this up or down at this point. Thank you, Chair Powell. I uh, have been thinking about the procedural aspects of this since we, since the foundation signaled that they might consider a couple of those on Regent Roche's amendment list, non-material because it immediately creates the question of are we approving agreements today or they we got to have more approvals as Regent Swiggum raises. So I've come to the conclusion, even though I seconded this, that uh, I think we, we need to move forward with the agreements as there's written. I don't think that that were that a typographical things caused me any concern whatsoever. And I think that would fall into the specter of what uh, director Steve's just mentioned, but Unless we're going to add to this what the non-material changes are, i.e., you know, the couple things that were, I do think it creates a slippery slope that I worry about. Um, I realize it's done in the spirit of trying to help advance this, but we might be better off leaving these for a later amendment after we get the documents approved as are. Regent Shue. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. Um, Regent McMillan, I... I'm trying to understand, are you saying you would support uh, the Mayron Amendment if we added specific things to it to try and um, allow us to improve the agreement so that people can support it? Regent McMillan. Yeah, thank you, Chair Powell and Regent Shu. I think the preferable approach is is not to empower the chair to do anything other than sign agreements that have been typographically corrected, perhaps. I have no concern about typographical stuff, but we either go down a path of making no changes or we <laughs> we reiterate, we, we state in this mayor on amendment what they are, and I'm preferable at this point to approving the agreements as written and not going after the parking and uh, defining an associate as non-material changes, because I think that's going to take us a while, and I don't know that it's worth it. Okay, a few others want to talk. Before before I recognize other regents, I would like to call on uh, General Counsel Peterson, who I think may have a, a thought or two on this topic. Maybe I'll just stand at this mic. <coughs> um, just a procedural suggestion. Um, obviously, this board has the authority to address this in any of the dimensions that have been discussed. Um, if the tenor of the board is to approve these agreements as is today, um, there's always an option for the parties um, to do some clarifying work and bring it back to the board for a, a consent agenda clarification process a month from now. And presumably, those would be non-material and could be easily um, adopted at that point. Obviously, today you would be blessing these agreements in their current form, and sort of those who are interested in the clarifying amendment would need to trust that uh, everybody would just work in a collaborative fashion to bring forward uh, a slightly revised version um, in March. So that's another option. Regent Mayron, uh, listening to the discussion and in view of General Counsel's view on this, do uh, you have energy to withdraw I your do. motion? I'm going to withdraw my amendment, and I, I like the uh, suggestion and the option that General Counsel Peterson has offered to us, uh, which is to uh, address hopefully collaboratively with the foundation between now and the March meeting these few changes and present it uh, to the consent agenda uh, for the consent agenda if that's the appetite of both parties. So uh, I will withdraw my amendment. Thank you, Regent Mayron. So the Mayron amendment is withdrawn. Um, and I'm going to pick up now on other those who wish to comment on the main item. Uh, and I would like to call, uh, uh, recognize Regent Davenport. Oh. 
Thank you, Chair. I just will briefly reiterate my support for the project and the work that's been done. Um, express my excitement about it because that's still there. And I want to underscore the confidence in UMF's work and the appropriate um, oversight changes that have been made recently. And I think um, the absence of such, such a doorstep, as you called it, um, is glaring. I think we're 50 years late, and so let's move forward. Thank you, Regent Davenport. At this time, uh, I would like to invite uh, student representative Austin Kraft to the table to bring forward uh, his questions and comments on behalf of the student rep representatives to the Board of Regents. So student representative Kraft, uh, welcome. Took over your spot here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board and presenters. Um, I'll be brief, I'll, I, I just have a comment. Um, so, yeah, I will be concise with that. It was brought up several times, uh, um, the, the role of the foundation, the sole purpose being to support the university. And um, I would just like to express briefly that um, the foundation's responsibility to act in the university's best interests, um, encompassing current and future needs of our community, including students and uh, their needs for um, affordable housing. Students, the tens of thousands of students um, around the Twin Cities campus uh, form the backbone of um, the campus's um, academic and cultural impact. Harkening back to earlier comments by uh, Regents, Regents McMillan and Rosha, um, one of the biggest needs facing students um, and one of increasing gravity is finding affordable housing options near campus. Given that this project will potentially affect primary sources of naturally occurring affording, affordable housing, there must be a strong commitment to championing affordability throughout this process, that the principles articulated in the concept plan are consistently and fully realized. We recognize that this development is years and decades from its completed state, but it behooves the foundation in fulfilling the concept plan's commitment to creating a welcoming place for students and the university community to be intentional about affordable housing options at every stage in this process. Thank you. Thank you, uh, student regent uh, Kraft. We very much appreciate your comments. I, I think President Gable would like to make a few remarks following your comments. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll address this to um, student representative Kraft and to our representatives and to the board as a whole that um, serving our students and maintaining affordability for our students is the cornerstone of everything that we do. Uh, this project um, does impact some of the uh, public-private partnership housing nearby towards its latter part. That is a fact. But the total number of beds available by all projections is sufficiently high, including those that are at university level pricings or market driven, which is sometimes lower. But that the overall commitment to make sure that every aspect of a student's educational experience is affordable, including total cost of attendance, which includes housing, is not only part of a the strategic plan overtly, as we discussed earlier today, but part of the commitment um, and mission of the university as a whole. And because the foundation exists to serve in the best interests of the university, and the university is overtly stating this as part of its strategic plan going forward, we can make that commitment to you, how it will take shape to be determined. Thank you, President Gable. So there are two more who would like to speak. I'd like to call on Regent Kenya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Kraft, for your comments. Uh, just so to, you know, get rid of any suspense, I will be supporting the, the, the resolution. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment um, before that, and not trying to beat a dead horse, but, um, you know, it, it's been suggested or floated that there could be, you know, other iterations of this or uh, am amendments and whatnot and, and just future things to be reworked. So I just wanted to make a final comment on the conversation we've had previously. Um, just because in the two exchanges we had, I, I think I heard two different messages. Um, the first time when um, uh, Mr. Levin and, and Council Bishop spoke, basically said, well, these are foundation procedures. These are, this is how all the committees um, act. And that was just being consistent with our bylaws. And you know, I just got the sense that that wasn't going to be exercised or wasn't intending to be exercised. And I said, all right, okay, um, we can leave that one. But then 
the other time, and maybe I misinterpreted what I heard um, from Chair Casey, um, but Chair Casey spoke about the business community and their insistence that board control, presence, whatever, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but just board involvement is a barrier, um, which then led me to believe, okay, maybe this provision will be exercised. Um, so maybe I'm speaking to the chair or general counsel or whoever, but I, I hope that in, in future um, conversations, revisions, um, that that's something that could be revisited. But um, otherwise, it, 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 it's a great project. And I, you know, when you focus on one thing, it, it sounds like you're not in favor or appreciative of all the work. But I will be supporting the, the resolution, but still uh, currently displeased with, with that part of it. Thank you. OK, uh, Chair Casey or Councillor Bishop, would either of you like to respond or elaborate? Um, I, I'm, the previous conversation is accurate, that those provisions apply to all of the uh, foundations committees, including all of the individuals that sit on those committees. So um, consistent with that, those provisions would apply to the special committee as well. I think Chair Casey was referring to um, the idea of having uh, public officials sitting on that special committee and that that perception that we have understood from our development advisory committee um, would imply that the project is university run and led versus having other individuals with subject matter expertise to help in that decision making. All right, I thank you. Right. So uh, Regent Rosa, we will uh, give you the final commentary and, thank, then, thank and you. then move to a roll call vote. Thank you. Um, and it's, I appreciate that, Mr. Chair, I'll be quick. I, the, the challenge that we've just gone through with respect to Regent Mayron's uh, proposed amendment and all that, that's reflective of the fact that we have, a pol uh, we, we have a process that doesn't usually provide us five days notice on a document that has a generational impact. You know, th th this, is, this is not the open and, um, and, and, and uh, accountable sort of process that we would normally have. And I find that frustrating because I, you know, I, I can sort of accept the result, but I certainly would like to have had it where we received it, we'd have time to make corrections, and then we're finally approving, uh, you know, something that we understand precisely what it's going to say. Um, that's that's frustrating to me. Um, point two: when I never would have conceived of, of serving on this board in a context where somebody says board the region's participation in decision making on an issue that is of supreme importance to the university is a problem and this board says okay we're out that's what this board is about is about defending the university of minnesota's interests and why would you not want the board of regents involved particularly because you know you're also ignoring some particularly valuable assets in terms of autonomy it's perhaps because we are charged with being very strong advocates for the university. Last point, I'm, I'm not gonna support this because I don't support this arrangement. I don't, I don't believe this provides enough uh, representation by the Board of Regents. I don't think it provides enough protection against things that can have a significantly negative impact on our core mission as it already exists. That's not to say I don't support seeking to develop this property. And this is not to say that I don't appreciate the foundation's tremendous work and resources in trying to find a better way. But as the structure is related, I, again, taking my 10,000 foot view, I believe the Board of Regents is still a critical element in these conversations, as was pointed out by Regent Simonson in our master planning concept. I mean, this is, this is really an extension of that. I believe we should be more involved and I appreciate the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Regent Rocha. Before I call the vote, let me just speak for myself um, uh, on this project. I think it is a, it's a tremendous vision. Um, I think we're, we'll be working with a very strong, very strong partner. I think the governance mechanism that's been developed is, is very, very sound uh, and very, very, very balanced. And so I look forward to, uh, I, w I really look forward with great excitement to the development of this initiative. But I also have to say that I'm equally excited by uh, my belief that uh, clarity uh, around East Gateway and moving forward with it uh, will we'll also bring clarity to um, other opportunities on campus, uh, particularly the development of the medical corridor. I mean, it's, it's going to bring a lot of other things into focus for us that are really going to uh, strengthen the university. So, so I'll be uh, I'll be in uh, in support. So, with that, uh, if we could call for the roll call. 
On the East Gateway resolution, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Hur is absent. Regent Shu. No. Regent Shu votes no. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rosha. No. Regent Rosha votes no. Regent Simonson. No. Regent Simonson votes no. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. The motion uh, passes. I think eight yeses, three noes. Uh, and thank you, thank you uh, to this board for the uh, excellent discussion and the, the way it in which it was conducted. I thought it was very, very good. Let's move now to the report uh, of the committees, um, beginning with the report of the Litigation Review Committee. Regent Beeson, please share your report with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Litigation Review Committee met yesterday, and the meeting we adopted a resolution to, uh, that authorized the closing of the meeting to discuss matters subject to attorney-client privilege. That concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Regent Beeson. Uh, Regent Rocha, will you share the report of the Audit and Compliance Committee? Yes, Mr. Chair. The Audit and Compliance Committee did not consider any action items this month. In our meeting yesterday, we had several discussion items. The committee reviewed the results of a recent external quality assurance review of the university's internal audit function. These reviews are conducted every five years in accordance with the internal audit professional standard. The item was presented by L Linda Gilligan, retired general auditor for the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, who served as the team leader of the review. The quality assurance review confirmed that our internal audit team does exemplary work across the university, and I thank uh, Vice Chair Kenyanya for his participation in that process. We spent the majority of our time focused on our external audit activities. The engagement team from Deloitte, who serves as our external auditor, provided their final summary of the fiscal year 2019 audit work. We were pleased to once again receive no findings in the audit of the university's financial statements. Uh, the committee reviewed the external audit plan for fiscal year 2020. This plan sets forth the audit scope, objectives, and approach the auditors will use. Members from the Deloitte engagement team shared the plan and discussed their assessment of audit risks, testing approach, and timeline for the audit activities. That work will get underway this spring. In our final item, Chief Auditor Klatt provided the committee with a brief internal audit update reporting that the 23% of recommendations rated as essential were implemented, which is significantly lower than the expected rate of 40%. Although the implementation rate was lower than expected, she assured the committee that all units are making satisfactory progress on addressing audits in their findings. Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, moving on with committee business, Regent McMillan, will you share the report of the Finance and Operations Committee? I will indeed, Chair Powell. The Finance and Operations Committee acted on six items this month. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to refinancing of debt for the Biomedical Discovery District here on the Twin Cities campus. I move its approval. Any discussion on the resolution related to the refinance, refinancing of debt for the Biomedical Discovery District? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Carries. Regent McMillan. Carry uh, three, on. three successive. Uh, or let's see. Next is a res is a real estate. Uh, the committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the purchase of three properties at 818 Essex Street Southeast, Southeast 924 Essex Street Southeast, and 510 Ontario Street Southeast, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I move approval of these real estate transactions. I think everyone's familiar with the with this transaction. Uh, any discussion or comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? All right, that motion carries. Regent McMillan. I now have three successive labor agreements. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with AFSCME Council 5, clerical and office support units, locals 3800 and 3801. I move approval. That's the first one. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that carries. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with AFSCME Council 5 Healthcare, a non-professional unit, Local 3260. I move its approval. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And the committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with AFSCME Council 5 Technical Units, Local 3937 and 3801. I move their approval. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. 
One more item of business. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the revised consent report, which includes the Central Reserve's general contingency, purchase of goods and services in excess of a million dollars, amendments to the university's civil service rules, five employment agreements, two capital budget amendments, one real estate transaction, and one schematic design. Sounds like a Christmas hymn, doesn't it? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I move approval of the revised consent report. <clears throat> All those in favor of approving the Finance and Operations Committee consent report, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. All right. Thank you, uh, Regent McMillan. Next is the report of the Mission Fulfillment Committee. Regent Anderson, please share your report. Chair Powell, the Mission Fulfillment Committee acted on two action items this month. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the merger of the College of Liberal Arts and the School of Fine Arts at the University of Minnesota Duluth. I move approval of this resolution. Any discussion or commentary on this important resolution? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Thank you. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the consent report, which includes approval of new, changed, and discontinued academic programs, conferral of tenure for outside hires, and granting of faculty emeritus status. I move approval of the consent report. All those in favor of approving the Mission Fulfillment Consent Report, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Chair Paul, that concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Anderson. That brings us to the Governance and Policy Committee, Regent Mayron. Thank you, Chair Powell. The Governance and Policy Committee considered two action items this month. The committee voted <coughs> unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to adoption of the Board of Regents policy code of conduct for members of the Board of Regents, which includes the two amendments the committee made to the code of conduct. I move approval of the resolution. All right, and thanks uh, once again to those who worked so diligently and carefully on this project. It's very good work. Um, any discussion of, of, of this motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the amendment to the bylaws of the Board of Regents. I move approval of the resolution. Any discussion of this resolution? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Mayron. That brings us to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, any new business? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. Six years on.